And here as our guest, we have a development economist. He is also a diplomat, a statesman, and a public intellectual. He is also a former Central Bank of Nigeria deputy governor. He's also the 2019 presidential candidate of the African Democratic Congress, Dr. Obadaya Malaifa. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's, it's an honor to be here. Okay, so let's just go straight to the interview. Now, in your opinion, what are the major challenges facing the Middle Belt region today? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, the, the challenges facing us in the Middle Belt are humongous. And by the Middle Belt, I am referring to uh, the, what is called the North Central region, you know, Benue, Kogi, Nasarawa, uh, parts of Niger, uh, Plateau, Taraba, Federal Capital Territory, Kwara. But for us, the real Middle Belt uh, refers to a region that is about 300,000 square kilometers that stretches to southern Borno, Adamawa, southern Kaduna, southern Kebi. You know, they're all parts of the Middle Belt. We face huge challenges. The number one challenge today is insecurity, of course. We, for the last more than 10 years, I would say, now, if you look at Southern Kaduna Plateau in particular, it goes to almost uh, 15 years of relentless killings, bordering on ethnic cleansing and genocide, the raping of women, uh, slaughtering of defenseless peasants, indiscriminate killing, elderly, children, women, youth, you know, and also we, we face today the challenge of disempowerment. The 1999 constitution has gerrymandered the structure of a federation in such a way that it curves out huge areas of the middle belt and aligns them path force uh, to the north. And this is something we find very strange. You don't like someone and you don't want to let them go. They must be with you whether they like it or not. So we've been disempowered. The structure of the Federation has been gerrymandered so as to disempower us. And of course, we suffer from political marginality, poverty, unemployment among our young people, uh, discrimination. If you are from Southern Kaduna, like I am, you face a kind of apartheid system. It's a new apartheid in which our people are excluded, they're marginalized, and they're humiliated by, by the government uh, of the state. So these are the huge challenges facing a region of about 300,000 square kilometers with about, a 40, about 40 million people. So if you look by geographical landmass and population, the Middle Belt is the largest region in Nigeria full of huge endowments of natural resources, solid minerals. It has the best climate in the whole country by far. It has the richest soil by far. Parts of the Middle Belt, like Plateau and uh, Mambila Mountain, it's like Europe, virtually like Europe. We can grow all the temperate crops as well as fruits and vegetables. A small local government like Bokos in Plateau alone can supply the whole of West Africa, not just Nigeria, the whole of West Africa with, with Irish potatoes. So the potential there is very, very, very huge. And yet we have a system that has humiliated us, has oppressed us, and that is committing uh, killings and ethnic cleansing on a scale that amounts to genocide. So these are the challenges we face today in the Middle East. Okay, remember that you can join the conversation simply by raising up your digital hand and I'll try as much as possible to accommodate as much questions and comments from the participants. Now, 
how let's talk about the killings the indiscriminate killings that the middle belts are currently suffering how do you think we can solve this issue well you see augusta this thing has gone on for too long in the case of plateau it goes back to the 90s in the case of southern kaduna in fact it goes back to the late 80s so this thing has been going on for too long for us to now regard it as a strategy that some people have uh, for conquest and hegemony of our people. And we face a government that doesn't care, that is unable or unwilling, whichever it is, uh, the effect is the same, to come to the aid of our people. So the solution for the immediate term, our solution really is for our people to begin to defend themselves. Our constitution makes the right to self-defense a fundamental right. It is enshrined in our laws and it is in conformity with international law, which prescribes that any community that faces an existential threat to their very survival uh, have an incumbent duty as well as moral obligation to take such steps as are necessary to secure the lives and properties of their people and of their community. It is also prescribed by natural justice, natural law, equity, and universal global ethics. So this is the next stage that we are entering, that each time we want to defend ourselves, the government sends in uh, the security authorities, the army, to come by area, dispossess our people of their dangons, their bows and arrows, and even uh, domestic implements they are dispossessed, and the next day these people come and have a field day slaughtering, raping, and burning down our communities. So we, we cannot give up. We are not about to commit suicide, definitely. So we will defend our people. We will encourage them to take whatever steps as are necessary to, to defend themselves without resorting to, to uh, an abuse of humanity or the terrorist methods that the enemy has been using against our people. It is our okay. fundamental right. And then of course, we, 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 we join you know, like-minded people in the South, in the West, the South, South, the Middle East, the, 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 the West, the, the East, uh, calling for restructuring and re-engineering of our federation so that these kinds of abuses of humanity will not happen. And of course, to appeal to the international community. Right now, the international community is silent. The UN is silent. America is silent. The EU are silent. Britain, France, Germany. All the civilized world have abandoned us to our fate. And this is a profound tragedy. And sooner or later, it will become a moral indictment of civilized values that these Western powers claim to possess. Okay, now you just said that um, people should defend themselves, but not resort to abusing of human rights like um, the enemy your words do. How then do you advise the people to defend themselves? No, I didn't say don't, well, okay, you, you put it in that language. I say, don't encourage anything that amounts to an abuse of humanity. You, you, when they are running, you chase them. Our forefathers, don't forget, the middle class people, uh, who they are, because they were never conquered by the Fulani. They were never, never conquered. As a matter of fact, it is the, it is the middle belt that put an end to the Fulani Jihad. And they did it in 1817 in a small town called Ushongo in Benue State, where the chief people 
stopped the jihad. They were hell bent on dipping it in the sea. That was their ambition. That was their stated goal. But an old man with a poisoned arrow stopped all that madness at the town of Ushombo. That is what exactly happened. They've never forgiven uh, to this day. So we're warriors. If you have a level playing field, I dared somebody the other day who was talking a lot of uh, bollocks. I'm sorry to use that number. And I, I, I explained to him that, look, don't express this kind of braggadocio that you are doing. If there was a level playing field, you wouldn't be talking to us like that. You dare not look us in the face to echo the language of, of uh, a poet. Uh, Kofi Awuno, the late Kofi Awuno, great Ghanaian poet. Uh, and uh, you know, so we were we were warriors. And if if an opportunity, if this a level fell playing field, uh, you know, our people are able to defend themselves. We don't need sympathy from anyone. All we need is a level playing field, and this nonsense will have to stop. When I say abuse of humanity, we are not going to kill children. We are not going to kill women. No, we are not going to do such things. The people coming for us, coming to kill us and our children, will have a right to take them on. And even international law allows the principle of hot pursuit. We can pursue them to their caves, to their Sahara desert, wherever it is they come from. You see, so that, that is the truth of the matter. We have a right to defend ourselves and to defend our people. Nobody can oh. deny us that right. Okay, now talking about um, disembowelment, which you mentioned initially, um, some of the notable leaders we've had in Nigeria and various sectors hailed from the Middle Belt. What did these leaders do? Well, you know, the, the Middle Belt is like the English constitution. It is not written anywhere but it exists in the heart and minds of the British people. It exists in the heart and minds of the Middle Belt peoples. Yakubu Gawan, General Yakubu Gawan, was a son of the Middle Belt. You will agree with me that he is the greatest leader this country has ever produced, by far. He was only 31 when destiny thrust him uh, as the occupant of the high magistracy of our great federal republic. A civil war was imposed on him by history and by providence. He fought the civil war with just one single objective, to keep the union together. And he saw Indigo as brethren. It's a misunderstanding between brethren. He had no hatred for Indigo. After all, uh, he was deeply in love with a young, beautiful, evil woman. He wanted to marry her. They had a child, had a son. But the army said, never, never, never. In a time of war, you can never marry from the enemy. I mean, they will have no secrets. So it was the, the armed forces that say, no, you can't do it. So he ended up with option B. But people like Murtala and others, uh, you know, uh, General, at that time, Colonel Yaradua and others, they wanted a war of annihilation. They wanted to annihilate the evil. And at some stage, Gowan nearly even caught martial uh, Murtala Mohammed because of the way he was doing things. So he fought that civil war to keep the union together. Uh, um, you know, not genocide against Indigo. He governed with humility and with justice. 
And you will agree with me that at the end of the war, he had the best post-bellum, post-war settlement ever in modern international politics, in which he said there were no victors and no vanquished. And a lot of money was poured into the rehabilitation, re reconciliation, and recon reconstruction program. It is true there were some things that were very sad, such as the cabinet took the decision that only 20 pounds should be allocated to every Igbo adult, regardless of how much they had left behind. That, of course, was difficult, it was painful, uh, you know. But beyond that, look at most of these infrastructures. The, the bits we have were from his time. All the flyovers in Lagos, massive reconstruction, investment in the railways, in infrastructures, they were all his work. All the others are just footnotes to great General Yaakub Gawan, and he was a son of the middle class. Well, you would want to say that people like Ibrahim Babunkida were sons of the middle belt. Uh, and I said, the middle belt idea is inscribed in our hearts and minds. It was not inscribed in the hearts and minds of people like Babunkida. They were servants and foot soldiers for the caliphate. And we have evidence of that. They were just there to fulfill the goals and objectives of the caliphate. And the time they failed to fulfill those, that role of servant, they were kicked out. So I strictly would not call them. Unfortunately, the middle bell is such that if somebody needs some political interest protected, they rush and say they are middle bells. But when they are hobnobbing with the caliphate and everything is good, they keep the middle belt at a, at a distance. We don't mind it because we know what we carry. We know the anointing and the destiny that the good Lord has apportioned to the peoples of the middle belt. We know how he has gifted our land, how he has gifted us as a people. And uh, we have no qualms about what anybody thinks. So. Really, this is my answer to your question. Okay, I can see Emmanuel Zomal hand, hand up. Emmanuel? Good evening. Man, good up? evening. Go ahead, please. Um, I want to sincerely appreciate the contribution by our great leader, Dr. Obadia Melafia. He's a renowned scholar, both home and internationally and an uh, illustrious son of the mid on the Emmanuel. I think we lost Emmanuel. He muted himself. He needs to unmute himself. Hello. Okay. Yes, are you with Emmanuel. Me? Yes, we are with you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Sincerely, uh, the Middle Belt happened to be the place where Nigeria would have been uh, what it is today. If you look at the great men who have served this country over the years, and they have given their best. And today, the Middle Belt is seen as a backyard where nobody wants to listen to what comes out of the Middle Belt anymore. And if you look at how the politics of this country goes, the only way where Nigeria is going to have the best leader and is going to turn around things that will make this country great is for the Middle Belt to come together as we have come together all the time to make things work. We proved that in 2011, when the Middle Belt decided that Yer Adwa's death will not bring an end to the Good Luck Jonathan's ambition. And we prove a point where we surprised the North by giving our vote. And they were shocked. Our vote in 2011 alone was something far more than the South East, South West, South South put together from the Middle Belt. So 
it is a surprise that Nigeria is still willing as if the minorities, which is the North, has already conquered every part of the country. We feel ashamed when we come out to make people understand that we hold this country when the Middle Belt and the South come together, we will end insecurity. We will end injustice. But up to now, we have not seen the green light from the Southern part of the country so that we will be able to make things work the way we want it. It is time up that we, 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 we stop wailing over a few minority people who carry guns just going into the bush and kill people where the majority have the knowledge, have sophisticated, uh, uh, you know, land and whatsoever that is needed to fix this issue. So it is our belief that the Middle Belt and Southern Nigeria, which is the greatest asset for Nigeria today, put together these regions, we will be able to transform this country and get what we want. If you listen carefully to what our leader said, Dr. Obadiah, he talked about those who serve like Yakubu Gawol. Yes, we know the intervention he has done and many people have misinterpreted his policies after the civil war. And till today, some are still willing that he caused what is happening to us today and what is happening to Nigeria. But it's not true. But if you look at critically, okay, let's cite the example, who brought about the 12 states in Nigeria, who put an end to Southern uh, region, Northern region where we are oppressed. The prison system was under, under the regional government where the middle belters were not having opportunity. Any middle belt fighter was put to prison for no reason under the regional government of 1963, but he put an end to it. Now, if you look at it at this point in time, every state has its own way of handling its own uh, affairs. But although the, if you have a strong president who may surpass the powers of the governors or a governor who is a surrogate of the caliphate will not exercise the powers that have been given to him in the constitution. And that is where we find ourselves. We talk about the state creation, like the Southern Kaduna, they have no business with the caliphate being in Kaduna state. They have no business with that. But today, no one even want to, maybe part of Southern Nigeria, want to like say, okay, who and who will speak for the Southern Kaduna people. We have other parts of the Middle Belt, like the Savannah State in Borno State. All these are areas by the time we put our heads together and get this country restructured, all those states that we are forcefully annexed to the Caliphate states, we will be able to put this country on the right footing. But thank you so much, Emmanuel. Thank you. Um, Until we get this thing right. Yeah, I, my last point, please. Until we get these things together, the Middle Belt and Southern Nigeria. We are not saying that we should alienate any part of the country, but we all we are saying is that let the right-minded people come together to make things right. And that's the only way we're going to salvage ourselves in this kind of mess we find ourselves together. Thank you, Augusta. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Thank you. I am going to, um, Dr. May life here. Would you want to yeah. comment on that? Well, yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Ima Zokmal, you know, my, my, my kid brother, uh, lovely to, to see you on this platform. And uh, I agree with uh, everything he has said. I mean, uh, no doubt. We are not saying that Yafuga Gaon was perfect, not at all. Uh, no leader ever is, you know, he had some of his own shortcomings. Uh, which he's the first to acknowledge. So we are not saying he was a perfect leader, uh, 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 but he was as good as they came from a military uh, administration uh, at the young age of 31, uh, which, was, which was extraordinary, which was remarkable. You know, so, uh, uh, and yes, uh, the Fulanis are only 5 million in the whole of Nigeria. And this 5 million has taken 95 million to ransom. This is totally unacceptable. In fact, the Hausa are telling us that 
look, our struggle is also their struggle. They have also suffered humiliation. They've suffered oppression. They've suffered exclusion. So look, the whole thing is leading to a new national consciousness, uh, the consciousness of liberation. And what unites us now with the South, we realize uh, deep bones, you know, going back far into antiquity. In fact, some historians are now beginning to realize that the Kwararafa, where the, the springboard of, you know, the Niger Congo cultures that go as far as Igbo land, Akwaibo, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and even as far as down to, to East and Southern Africa, right from the Middle Belt, the Nok culture spread to, to parts of Igbo land as well, parts of uh, Yoruba land as well. And this was at the heart of the Middle Belt. Today, when an Ifa priest in Yoruba land wants to go very deep, in incantations, he goes into a, an ancient language, and that was Nupe language. And if you look at the Igala, there is no the Iri civilization of Igbo land has its roots among the Igala people. Many of the people that are in Soka today are Igala in origin. So the Middle Belt has been at the crossroads of civilization. And our influence has spread far and wide. So we are deeply interconnected with Yoruba land. We are deeply connect, interconnected with the South and with the South South. So we have rediscovered our destiny as a collective group. We have rediscovered our unity with the South. And we believe that we can build on that unity to build a new Nigeria with or without the Fulanis, by the way, with or without the Fulanis, but a country based on civilized values, a okay. country based on justice and honor. Thank you. Okay, let us call the next person, Akin. Akin, I can see your hand up. If it's Akin Fakbounda, Akin Fakbounda, right? Ekalesa. Yes. Yes, a please go ahead. A Kalesa, a Kalesa. Okay, I uh, acquired these questions uh, privately, but we need to educate everybody in the audience too. I appreciate oh. Dr. Medlafia. I have several questions, then I have one or two suggestions. First question, is there no limit to our talking and talking and talking and talking publicly? We have been talking too much the last one year. Is there no limit to it? That's number one. Number two, Dr. Melafi, I really think Nigeria United, the way we have been saying, is it realistic? Can Nigeria be united and remain as one? Because you have to agree on the premise of your journey. Third question, is 2023 capable of giving dividends that will satisfy everybody? Knowing that it has to be based on 1999 constitution. Can we proceed to 2023 election? If nothing happens, to the 1999 constitution, maybe slight amendments. Is it realistic? Can we really get a just uh, result for all components of Nigeria? That's three posers. I want you to answer. Now, I'd like to have suggestions. General Gowon has been too quiet for no reason I don't understand. Is the standing leader of Nigeria today? What is the problem I cannot call fellow head of state to go and occupy Asso Rock? To say 
you, General Buhari, you are our subordinate. We all fought for Nigeria together. Either you kill us in this villa, or you do what we are telling you. Is it too much to ask for the retired head of states? Yes, Instead yes. of just, just saying Nigeria, enemy of Nigeria, enemy of that and all that, just talking polemics. Can they get six of them together if they truly believe in Nigeria? How can Buhari override all the standing three, four, five, six head of state now in terms of what is good for the I want because I know you are close to General Gowon. He's been praying alone. Prayer is no longer useful. He shouldn't be afraid of death anymore. You don't want to shoot him in the villa. Let them shoot him. What is wrong with that? Final okay. question. Final poser. There is the Southern Middle Bell Leadership Forum. The older people are being in charge. Adibanjo, Edwin Clark, they are all old. Is it not time to revive a platform for the four zones to talk together and agree on what to do? That's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Okay. So much. Let yes. us hear from Dr. Maila. Yeah. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Akifa Kohunda. He's one gentleman I have very high regards for. He's a technocrat, highly accomplished, a man of great sagacity. He's retired, but he's not tired. Uh, up to, was up to director in the cabinet office, in the presidency, uh, very fearless patriot. Uh, so I have very high regards for him. Well, let me just start even from the case of, well, too much talk. Well, I, I, I don't know about others, but I can talk for myself. But certainly, uh, I am often very reluctant to talk. And if I had to uh, honor all the invitations I get, I can tell you uh, I would be on the screen on a daily basis. I've had to reject many, more than those I've actually accepted to speak on. That's the reality of it. But again, is it, is it not better? Somebody say it is better to jaw jaw than to war war. So that jaw jaw process is important because we're enlightening our people. We're engaging with mass publics. But I don't think it stops there. For most of us, it doesn't stop there. There is the work of engagement, civic engagement with groups across the country, with our people. And even those, even with those we regard as our enemies, they call us for discussions. We we'll make our views very clear to them. Look, sir, if we had not been talking, more than a million Nigerians would have perished by now. Our talk has raised enough concern to check them on their paths. It's like you are driving in the middle of the night and then you see an antelope on the road. You put your full lights, the antelope doesn't, want, doesn't know whether to run left or run right, it becomes confused and stops on its tracks. I believe that our commentaries have served as a kind of such light on the enemy and his wicked plans for our country. And that has helped to stop them on their track, or at least to delay them from the great wicked plans that they have for this country. So I wouldn't say people should not talk. Uh, I think people should talk more than they should carry arms and start killing here and there. And I'm not one of those who would recommend people to wake up one morning and start looking for a full at least to kill. God forbid, I don't want that. I don't want to see that. Even my name, Melafia, means a man of peace. We should seek peace and pursue it. But we will never keep quiet. 
in the face of evil and the face of injustice. Now we should continue to organize and conscientize our people to resist the enemy. Well, as for Yakubu Gawan, yes, I'm very close to him. Uh, you know, I have stood for him on certain forums. Uh, so I know his mind. He's a very spiritual person. And he's a deeply, deeply compassionate person. He loves Nigeria so much. But at more than 80 years, he feels he has made that existential choice, which some of us who love him don't agree with. We have said, Daddy, honestly, we don't agree with you. But he has made his stand. And uh, his view is that for him, no more politics. Don't forget, in 1976, after the death of Murtala, they wanted to bring him back and kill him and execute him publicly. If you were in a different country, they would have done that. His, his, his kinsman was not so lucky, Joseph De Chigomo, who knew absolutely nothing about the coup. They just brought him and slaughtered him and executed him, including the only brother-in-law he had. Zachary also executed for something he didn't even know. And a lot of other people who paid a heavy price. <coughs> that pain is still in him. He's carrying a very big wound. And he feels that for now, what God has laid on his heart is for him to have this ministry of prayer. And as believers, we don't underestimate, undermine the, the <laughs> the ministry of prayer. Some people are just called to be intercessors. He feels that at the age of 31, he ruled this country. He ruled this country for nine and a half years. He feels that any other thing he should have, he could offer for Nigeria, he has offered it. Already. So we don't agree with him. I agree with you that honestly, if I were him, I would have stood out publicly and I would have spoken. And you know, under Babangida, they disgraced him by trying to encourage him to go into politics, only to undermine him in his own world. So the embarrassment was too much. And he took it as a sign that God doesn't want him to be involved in politics anymore. That is as far as the one goes. As for 2023, I agree with you that uh, 2023 is very iffy, very, very iffy. Uh, I don't think it's in our interest. I think somebody needs to mute themselves because uh, we love kids, but there's a baby talking there. Uh, you need to mute yourself so that we can we can be heard. Now, uh, uh, 2023 is, is, is very, very dodgy. And I don't think we should encourage it because uh, with the same people, with the same institutions in place, the same constitution, they are now going to dominate. And don't forget, they have brought millions of illegal aliens into this country. And through this NIN, they are giving them citizenship, they are giving them ID cards to become Nigerians overnight, thereby changing the demographics of our country to give them a kind of majoritarian stake in our democracy. And one of them boasted to me that we are not the majority, whatever you say, we are majority, democracy is a game of numbers. So, hey, what are you talking about? So with that kind of mindset, that kind of thinking, demo, I mean, it is not in our interest for 2023 to happen. But again, we have to be careful. If it were possible to mobilize enough people to take over and win the elections, then we could say, okay, let's do that. And then use that opportunity to re-engineer the constitution. So, but I, that probability of it happening is a bit remote, uh, to be honest with you. And as for the, uh, the leadership forum, I have been part of that process, uh, you know, as a kind of quiet participant. Uh, of the engagement between 
uh, the middle belt and the south, uh, the west, the east, and the south south. Um, Dr. Fakohunda is saying that this thing is dominated by old people. Isn't it, isn't it about time that younger people you know, took over the stage? Well, I don't know. Uh, nobody is stopping younger people from organizing themselves. The elders have a forum. And there's, there are privileges in being an elder in the sense that you have some kind of diplomatic immunity as an elder. You know, I can't see anybody going to Bondu, our beloved uh, bar clerk into detention, you know, and so on. I don't see that happening. Uh, so, you know, they have that privilege uh, to be able to speak on national issues. Uh, they are not going to stand for elections. They are not looking for any public office. So they can say things as they are and they have their place and they've played a fantastic role in this country. Let's, let's grant it to them. Uh, but as for the younger people, uh, nobody is stopping younger people from, from, from organizing themselves. Uh, so I would say, let a thousand flowers bloom. So thank you so much. Yes. Are we together? Hello, Augusta. There seems to be silence. Okay, <laughs> I have I have responded to the to the question asked by Dr. Fapo Hunda. So, any more questions? But can you hear me? Can you all hear me? If the host is kind of frozen out, let's hear the next person. I can see Comrade Ankyo Briggs here. Comrade, do you have a question? I also can't hear anything. Uh -huh. okay. Doctor, I can hear you very clear. I can hear you very well. Okay, uh -huh. some people can hear me. Emmanuel Zopma can hear me, but uh, uh, 
maybe we well well uh, augusta rejoins us i think there must be a technical hitch somewhere maybe we'll continue with the questions does someone want to ask a question if we, if we cannot be heard yeah well maybe comrade Ankyo Briggs would have another question. We'll have a question. Well, maybe as we um, we wait for the hostess or the host to to rejoin us, um, let me go ahead and continue my vision of uh, Zopma raised the issue of what is the plan we have? I think the plan, you know, we need to work on is how to salvage our country and to take our own future into our own hands. And I said with or without the Fulanis, if the Fulanis uh, insist on imposing a caliphate on the whole country, then it cannot happen. Uh, we will not allow it to happen. We will, we will invoke our right uh, to disagree, you know, uh, to forge ahead based on our own values of, of enlightenment and of civilization. This is the truth of the matter. The reason why I do not come out and say Nigeria should break up, let us break up, is actually for two reasons. The first one is that I don't think God makes mistakes. Albert Einstein, the greatest physicist of the 20th century, famously declared that God does not play dice with the universe. And by that Einstein meant that God does, doesn't just play games of chance with the universe. So he didn't make a mistake in coupling out this divergent gaggle of tribes and ethnic communities and nationalities into a country called Nigeria. Our size, our diversity, our natural endowments, they are a source of strength and should not be a, a source of, of weakness. But those who have taken it upon themselves to oppress the peoples of this country with their shameless born to rule mentality have decided that they are going to spread jihad by force. They are going to replicate the caliphate across the whole country by force of arms. And they, they intend to take over our lands by force of arms. Of course, we would not allow it. We shall resist them. And if Nigeria has to go ahead Hello. without them. I mean, uh, Njenje, you are the co-host now. OK. Sorry, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Hello? I said, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. That was yeah, OK, and if, exactly. And if, if we have to, if we have to, to go ahead without them, to forge ahead and form a nation without them, so be it. Uh, but there is no way we are going to accept Sharia for the rest of the country. There is no way we are going to accept their vision of the caliphate, uh, that they are buying arms from Turkey, from Iran, from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar. They are bringing in dollars and weapons to commit genocide as a means of spreading their evil political ideology. We are not going to accept it. We will resist it. That is the reality on ground. 
It's a, it's a game of chess. And I think let's play our pieces wisely without revealing ahead what our strategies are. But believe you me, there are strategies. Uh, but let's play the game, uh, move our pieces, our knights, our queens, our kings, based on what the enemy does. Based on what the enemy does. Uh, the Holy Book enjoins us to be as wise as serpents and to be as harmless as doves. So in this, in this very intricate power game, wisdom and knowledge with courage must go together. Yeah. So, so let um, us continue the engagement with the South. The Middle Belt should continue the engagement with the South with Yoruba land, with the East, with South-South. Let's continue our engagement. Let's continue our discussions. Let's continue our consultations in order to form a strong and powerful alliance that will enable us to survive, come rain, come shine. Um, good evening, everyone. I understand the, the host is having problems. Uh, I have a question for, and I can see some hands. Mazi, okay, you are there. What question do you have for our guest? Mark Jacob, you are there as well. Please, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Um, it's good to see you again. Thank you. Um, you looking well and um, healthy. Thank you. Um, um, uh, there's always something that you know that baffles me when we talk um, about these issues, and that is um, the um, the the idea of caliphate. The idea of caliphate, and um, I know you're a man that likes to um, think precisely, and that I've been trying to, you know, get my head around this. Caliphate, who are they? I know you've worked in the, the, the diplomatic circle and um, you must have an idea who these people are. And um, as a Nigerian, um, if someone is trying to dominate me and people are talking about this domination, it's important that I have a, a clear idea who these people are. Are they Meiti Allah? Are they the, um, who are they? What is their name? How do they operate? Do they have meetings? Do they, is it an ideology? I want to understand what is this caliphate? Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mazi Okoye. Lovely meeting you again. Uh, you've asked me a question that can take us all night. But let's start from the beginning that in 1804, when a group of Fulani clerics led by Uthman ibn Fodio started a jihad uh, from Sokwato and they killed the Hausa kings because they claimed they were not pure Muslims and they were mixing with animism. And they took the jihad as far as uh, Maiduguri, but the Borno people resisted them. El Kanemi Shehun Borno wrote famous letters to uh, uh, Usman Demfodio. There are heavy dis theological disquisitions on Islam, even showing that, the, look, you are later converts. Islam came to us the 10th century. It came to you people around the 12th, 13th century. So, you know, we are far better Muslims than you are. You can't come here to preach to us about Islam when we've, we've had this religion for, for centuries already. 
Uh, and in any way, uh, he conquered most of Hausa land and he spread it uh, down to Ilori. Uh, he was stopped somewhere from marching through the, to the east. He was stopped at Ushongo in Benue State. In 1914, when Lord Lugard, who was a military adventurer and a member of the Freemasons, and his wife, his girlfriend at the time, Flora Shaw, was dabbling in occultism as well as being a part time journalist and pamphleteer. So over some whiskey or whatever, they decided that, look, they want to join the North and South into one protectorate. And uh, they got a, got a, got a great, get, go ahead uh, from, 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 from Downing Street and from the British Parliament uh, to go ahead. There was no any concrete plan for it. And secondly, World War I had just broken. Britain needed to conserve money and to build up a war economy by extracting more surplus from the colonies. So it made economic sense to unite North and South. There were only half a, half a dozen people at that who signed that document according to, to historians. One was uh, Meiturare, Sultan of Sokoto, another one was Emir of Kano, another one was Shenhun Borno, another one was Obong of Kalaba, another one was, uh, I think, Alafin of Oyo, and then one Lagos Yoruba uh, lawyer was in attendance. There was no indeed the present, there was no middle belt present. The Hausa people were not there. Now, the caliphate believed that that thing was meant to favor them because you know, that they were the majority at the amalgamation of 1914. And when the British were going to leave, they returned the mess that they had taken from the caliphate. The night of independence, they returned it, they took it to Sokoto and returned it. The caliphate believed that it was a gesture that the British were handing Nigeria to them. That is, from the spiritual level, that is their belief. Now, if you look at it, when Charles came here, his first port of call was to Sokoto, nowhere else. Now, in the northern region, and that is all, all part of it, that it was by no accident that the, 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 the committee on minorities had recommended strongly that regions should be created for minorities, particularly in the North. The colonial government refused to honor it, refused at all. And the idea was to preserve the North as a huge federating unit. So the 1960-63 constitution created the North as a monolithic entity that was two thirds the rest of the country. And in fact, it violated the first principle of federalism. According to the father of federalist theory, Sir Kenneth Weir, a Gladstone professor of government at, at Oxford in those days. And uh, he taught that the first principle of federalism is that no federating unit should be so large as to incur fear and suspicion and threats from the rest of the federating units. The British have protested that honestly, they didn't intend the North to rule forever, but they did. In the sense that by creating this huge monolithic region, refusing to cover a middle belt region. They wanted the North to be so big and so preponderant that it will call the shots forever. And that is why, in fact, that's why those who bring the idea that, oh, we should just revert to 1963 constitution are uh, being intellectually lazy because it collapsed because it has too many defects. Why go to something that has collapsed? So, so, now the caliphate is the emirate system. 
based strictly on Fulani rulership. It's a feudal structure. They hold meetings. They have secret societies based on religious orders. You have the Kadiriya, you have the Tijaniya, you have the Salafi, they're all there. No, you cannot, you cannot be anything important in Nigeria without their approval. Take it from me. Even down to things like if you want to become a presidential candidate, uh, you must go and declare allegiance. In my own case, I refuse to do it. But I won't go into that more. I won't go into any details. But there you go. Uh, so that's that's how they operate. They have regular consultations. They intermarry. If you want to understand how these guys behave, go back to Antonio Gramsci, the Marxist communist political philosopher from Italy who propounded the theory of hegemonia, that the best way to, 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 to dominate a people is to create a hegemonic order. It is based on political power. It is based on the force of ideas. It is based on cultural domination. In fact, when you have successfully applied hegemonia, the people you are oppressing and dominating will love being dominated and oppressed, which is exactly what has happened to the Hausa people under the Fulanis. It is a very pernicious order. They are in constant interaction with each other. Amadou Kumasi wrote a book called The Barons. Many people have ignored that book. It's, not, it's written almost like an allegory, but it's a very serious book. If you read it, you will understand the modus operandi of these people known as the caliphate. I've put myself into too many troubles already and I wouldn't want to be more graphic, uh, but please kindly understand with me, kindly bear with me, that this system is real. This system of power is more powerful. Look, Babangida was being ordered on what to do and what not to do. He couldn't overstep. No leader in the North could overstep his boundaries. And no leader could emerge without the tacit approval of the powers that be behind uh, the throne. So it is a pernicious system of power. And I, my, one of my theories is that the great ki the killings and evils we are seeing is because that system of hegemony is under threat. So they are acting like Himalayan tigers that are wounded, that are threatened. It has been threatened by globalization. It has been threatened by technology changes that people now have access to education and information, they can think for themselves, they can reason for themselves who are being hoodwinked. So the system is feeling very threatened. That is why we are seeing this kind of very violent reactions from, from, from this system. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Malafia. I apologize for the breaking transmission on my part. <laughs> I mean, Nigeria is due to um, bad network, but let's move on. Yeah, you I'm got us worried. You got us worried, the... Augusta. You got us very worried. <laughs> I, I apologize. I, I really apologize for that. Um, I'm going to call the next person, Ayo Oshunloye. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Milavia. Thank Good you. Good to meet you again. Thank you, sir. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, first, the tiger has been caged. Yes. The Himalaya tiger, it has been <laughs> caged. Amir. It is only for us to make sure that we lock the gate properly. Yes. Sure. 
I, I must confess my preference for a united Nigeria because I'm a Pan-Africanist. I believe that for any man, any black man to amount to anything in the world, Africa must do great things like every other great country in the world. And Nigeria is the nearest and the stepping stone for a united Africa. We must not allow in our time that Nigeria should break. I, I am committed to make sure that Nigeria does not break. That's number one. Thank I you. come from a place where we believe as an article of faith in egalitarianism. And we, we do not recognize the kind of ascription that some people are ascribing to themselves that they are born to rule. I think when I was growing up, I knew them as hewers of wood and drawers of water. They, they cannot come and become something that we do not, they, 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 cannot, they cannot put us down. And it is because we have been lax for too long. I want to use this opportunity to appeal to the middle belt intellectuals to get literature written out in their native languages. Let people or the different, let the Tarok, the Kadara, the Gwari, the Bira, let people write books, write literature that their children can start to read and they will know they can be proud of their own nationality. The, most people of the North or the Middle Belt had been internally colonized with the use of the market language. And it is one of the first things that ought to be done in this struggle for freedom. The second point I want to make is that many people in the Middle Belt, they have some kind of attitude to the Southwest, thinking that the Southwest um, claims some form of superiority. Dr. Melafia is, a, is, a, is an example of somebody from the Middle Belt who does not have that kind of uh, angles. And I want the intellectuals in the Middle Belt to convince their people that the people of the Southwest are their best friends. It was the people of the Southwest that supported the UMBC to be able to become a national, to, to, to come to national recognition. At that time, the leaders of the UMBC were on a permanent salary from the, from the incomes of the Southwest. And everything was being done to make sure that we can raise people who are politically astute. Same thing with the South Bonu. And if the, adv the, the advances that had been made at that time, we had worked on it and we had sustained it, we probably will not be saying what we are saying today. The very first thing we should do is to break that yoke of language. Let everybody speak his mother's language. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Melafia, you want to respond to that? Yes, indeed. I think I should. Uh, thank you so very much, Mr. Chief uh, Ayo Oshunloye. I very, very much appreciate you, sir. Now, I actually share the same sentiments with you that our first instinct is Nigeria should not break up. And I'm also a Pan-Africanist. I used to work for the African Development Bank. Uh, it was a platform that enables me to know the whole continent of Africa. I visited virtually every country doing projects for the African Development Bank. Then I worked for the African, Caribbean and Pacific group of states. I was chief of staff in Brussels for five years. I traveled to almost 70 countries. 
I know every corner of the Caribbean from St. Lucia to Jamaica, Grenada, Solomon Islands in the Pacific, Papua New Guinea, you know, uh, all the lot. And one thing is, all of them look up to Nigeria. The whole of the black race look up to Nigeria. You know, food is being played on their television station. I was shocked. Uh, Tiwa Savage, Two Face. You go to Caribbean, they are playing them as though they know them. You know, so our influence has spread so much. We we are the symbol of the black race. We don't know it. So for me, I, I would prefer to be a small fish in a big pond than to be a big fish in a small pond. But sir, wishes are not reality. We can wish for something and it can still work happen. For it. We work for it. We can work for it. But based on systems analysis, pure systems analysis, input output analysis, at current trends, with our rising demographics, corruption, nepotism, bad governance, human rights abuses, climate change. If you put this thing into an institutional order that cannot manage them well, within the next 20 years, Nigeria cannot exist. Just based on scientific principles, no country can survive that. So our wishes are not necessarily causes that we can write to success, but we have to work at it and do our best. But if it fails, it will not be, it will be disappointing, but it will not be something very new. Nations have risen and fallen. Civilizations have risen and fallen. And also on the issue, the, the people are very, they are very strange, you see, because they know the caliphate is a feudal order where a Hausa man who is a plebeian looking into the face of an aristocrat is enough to, for them to chop off his head. And it's a completely different civilizational outlook from Yoruba land, where even the king, the Oba, cannot oppress people beyond any reasonable degree. The Oyomesi, will give him Paros eggs, and that is a sign that he must commit suicide. Nobody will take his life, but he will take his own life by his own, life, by his own hand because he has violated the Republican order and the humane traditions of the ancient Yoruba people. The people we are dealing with, they are just the opposite of that. They don't believe in humanity. They use religion for class and futile perpetuation. They are brutal. Compared to even the Republica Indigo, Professor Taslim Olawale Elias, our greatest lawyer by far in the history of Nigeria, became president of the World Court. His, his classical book on uh, African customary law shows that in, in, in Negro society, there was no capital punishment. The highest thing they could do is to exile a man from his kinsmen. It was considered the worst, worst calamity than even death. So in a way, the, the Igbos were like Greeks in terms of their level of culture and civilization. Same with Yoruba, same with Middle Belt. But the people we are dealing with, they are alien to that tradition of humanism. And then thirdly, that middle belt, let them write their own books and tell their own story. I agree with you. Uh, that needs to be done because Chino Achebe said that, uh, uh, you know the prophet he said, that uh, unless uh, the lion learns to tell his own story, his story will be always be written on in favor of the hunters. So it is better for us to tell our own story in our own tongue than for our enemies to tell our story. And then the final point about Middle Belt, well, there are elements of that. You know, it happens 
uh, in every encounters. When you meet white people too, uh, even when they are not being racist, you feel, become sensitive and you feel as if they are being racist to you. You know, me, yeah, I've learned not even to be, to see racism, you know, people can be stupid or people can be nice. So me, I judge people on who they are. But there are elements of that, but you see, it is done without basis when the uh, middle belt feel that, it's not just in Europe, but even in the Igbo, they feel, we feel that you people are sometimes behaving as if you are very superior and you treat us in a rather condescending way. Like, let me tell you, I was 21 when I graduated from university. In the late 70s, that was very uncommon. It was not typical. Uh -huh. So when I went for NYC, the first time I ever left home, the, the first time I ever crossed the Niger and I went to Ondo State, I was sent to an Anglican school to teach. Most of the peoples refused. When I came to class, they walked away that they had, I'm not come to teach them. That uh, you brought this Hausa boy who doesn't even have Wayek. How can he come and teach from five students? So I still remember the principal. He's late now. God bless his soul. So it became an issue. So they said they should, uh, they counseled the pupils to just give me a try. Let them try me for a week or two. Uh, if I'm not coping, because they had never seen me teach, or they just saw me and they said, no, this guy cannot be a graduate. He brought this Hausa boy here to come and just waste our time. So, well, after teaching the first day, second day, third day, I became the most popular teacher in the whole school until I left till today. I'm in touch with many of them. But you see, these are attitudes. Uh, you people just lump us with the houses and Fulanese. It's only now that consciousness is, you know, making things clear that we are very, very, very different. I think what unites us with Yoruba land, with Igbo land, with the South South, is far more than the things that separate us. And one thing with Middle Belt people is that they can be very docile, you know, because of a long colonial history. Uh, but I can assure you, uh, they are not stupid. And uh, anyway, so next question, please. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Meilafia. Due to time constraints, um, we'll just we'll take questions. We'll allow you to react just to questions, and then we'll leave the comments um, and the comment session. Let us go to the next person, Ms. Briggs. Ms. Uh, Briggs. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me just say that uh, Dr. Meilafia is an unusual guest. As long as he's happy to stay with us, we'll be happy to take all his questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. I, okay. I'll, I'll, be, I'll stay on. No problem. Okay. But let us hear from um, Ms. Briggs. Ms. Briggs, I have asked you to unmute. Okay. Okay. I can see that. Thank now. you so much. All right. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes can. Comrade. Go ahead. Okay. How are you, comrade? I'm very Good evening. Well done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, quick, uh, very quickly. Um, the the topic being that um, discussing the, the the prospect, if you like, of um, the the middle belt and um, the middle belt and the southern part of Nigeria um, working working together toward the presidential um, toward the presidential uh, candidate um, I've personally I've discussed this um, with a few people that are already on this um, on this program this evening so I'll go straight to raising uh, some points on this uh, on this issue first of all I want to say that the the Issue. There is absolutely no argument, should be no misunderstanding that the presidency is to rotate to southern Nigeria. Now, if it is to rotate to southern Nigeria, it is southern Nigerians all 
all southern Nigerians that um, will have this of equity uh, to which part of southern Nigeria in terms of the geopolitical zone it should rotate to. Um, the Yorubas have had eight years of a passenger from 1999 to 2007. Um, the North had it, unfortunately it was cut short. Uh, Jonathan had it by election in 2011 and by finishing the, uh, to the Northern part of Nigeria. And now with hindsight, if you ask, um, gone for election, say in 2011, uh, I would have probably said no with hindsight. But then we all know how um, it came about that uh, the South South and the Middle Belt and the South East supported and the Southwest even supported the call um, that Jonathan should run in 2011. It was because of the pressure that was applied on the rest of Nigeria. So what we are enduring today, what Nigeria is suffering today, I think that was really the kickoff um, of this, um, of the genesis of what we are enduring today. So um, Jonathan did not get to be president second tenure. That's not um, for me, as far as I'm concerned, coming from the Niger Delta. Um, if he says he didn't win election, then he didn't win election. Let's move on. So he didn't win election. It has gone back uh, to the north. Buhari is finishing um, his uh, second tenure. So the north would have had um, its two tenures. So in my opinion, I would say that if it is in the South, and I think it should be, and it must be in the South, um, uh, equity demands on my part anyway, and I've said this openly more than um, three, four years ago now, uh, most of my brothers here who are from the Southeast will bear me out to that, that I have maintained that if the Ndibo believe, and it is up to them, that it should rotate to them in the South, I believe that the South should support Ndibo to produce the best they have or the worst they have, whichever one they choose uh, to, uh, to produce for Nigerians to choose from them. So therefore, whether it is APC or PDP or any party, it should, um, they should bring such a candidate for equity sake. Now, having put that aside, um, I do not believe that what we have endured in this uh, since the 2015 and uh, what we all now see very clearly that is playing out the killings and the plan to take over people's lands and things like that. Um, I do not believe that there is going to be a free and fair election. And um, the, uh, the, the, the bill that he signed, which in my opinion is, um, is a bill to rig election uh, of the electoral law. I think that that makes it very clear what 2023 is going, to, is going to be like. Who is going to be the president, where the person is going to come from, this so-called born to rule law, um, 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 the, whoever they, they call themselves, they have taken this as far as they're going to take it and they have made um, their decisions. Now, the issue of the South and the Middle Belt coming together, for me, I believe that that is the, the key to what we are all requesting for, which is to justice and equity. Because if the Middle Belt of so many different ethnic nationalities and the Yorubas of the Southwest and the Ndibu of Southeast and the different ethnic nationalities of the Niger Delta um, region. If we can all accept that we have a common enemy, it's not that we don't have our own issues, we do, 
but we have a common enemy. And if we have a common enemy and we come together and we're able to work together, then we can isolate our common enemy. Now, I do not believe this ideology that, and I am able to recall, I'm one of the people that were able to uh, be taught uh, history in, in the primary school and in secondary school before the war. So um, definitely I know uh, I have read history of, uh, of Nigerian uh, history and the role that the different ethnic nationalities have played and who we are. Um, I do not believe that I can be a good Nigerian, nor do I even want to be, if I am not allowed to, first of all, be a good Ijo person. Therefore, my ethnic nationality for me as a person, and I want it for every other person, that we have to, an Igbo man has to, first of all, make sure that his evilness is protected. His rights as an evil man is protected and he's able to defend it if he chooses in Nigeria. And it should apply for every ethnic nationality. I do not um, accept the idea that because Lugard put Nigeria together in 1914, um, that somehow that, that has the blessing of God. I do not believe it, I've never believed it, and I'm not going to believe it because I know that Lugard created Nigeria. God created the Ikore man, created the Igbo man, created the TV man, created the, uh, the different ethnic uh, nationalities. He did not, God did not create Nigeria. Man created Nigeria and it's not working. It has not worked, it is not working. Um, I am happy that we all here somehow believe in democracy and therefore we are able to say, um, someone can say he believes in one Nigeria or she believes in one Nigeria. And someone like me can say, well, I'm not prepared to sacrifice my people. I'm not prepared to sacrifice myself, my state, my region for, for one Nigeria. When one, what is one Nigeria? When we have a situation where the military is in, uh, the, uh, the hands of a particular set of people. All our resources is in the hands of one particular set of people. The political power, everything. Nigeria, I mean, um, there is nothing to be afraid of anymore right now, the way I see it in, uh, in Nigeria. Na there is nothing for me as a person that is an Ijo person from River State for me to defend when it comes to Nigeria, absolutely nothing. I will defend my people, I will defend my state, I will speak for my state, I will speak for the ethnic nationalities that make up Southern Nigeria um, and the Niger Delta and all of that. But to say that I will do that because it is for the good of Nigeria, no. It is not because Nigeria itself, there is nothing today that is good about this country. You see, how can anybody kidnap a four-year-old, a four-year-old and hold a four-year-old for four weeks? And then you have leaders in Nigeria that will turn a blind eye to killings in Kaduna, to killings in Southern Kaduna, <laughs> in a Benue state, in so many other states, and then rush to um, Joss because it is claimed that Christians killed um, uh, headsmen. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the Christians that uh, the headsmen have been killing all these years is not, is, is, is not enough for someone to get up and go and visit um, uh, the, uh, the Christians in Southern Kaduna. You, you know, so I personally, I believe that if we accept that Nigeria should be restructured, but in my opinion, as of today, I have come to the conclusion that the people who believe Nigeria belongs to them, 
are not going to restructure Nigeria. So the, the next step we should take is to ask for uh, a referendum. Let us ask for a referendum. From that referendum, we will, will get to decide whether we want a new constitution. From mm -hmm. that referendum, we're going to decide whether we want to stay together, whether the Yorubas want to stay as Nigerians, or whether the Job people or the Ishakiri people or Igbo people want to stay in Nigeria. And if they say they do, let us ask for the terms under which we're going to stay together. But if we're going to say that we're looking towards an election in 2023, an election that who is going to emerge has already been decided, not just at the federal level, in the states, by a, a, uh, by a particular political party. I was horrified today to read in the papers that somebody like Stella Odwa have moved to APC. Let us bring it right down to, to the bottom level now. How can you move from what is seemingly better than APC and move to the one that we are all saying is worse than uh, the one that you're, uh, you're living. So to me, our politicians are afraid. And I think that we who are not politicians have a lot more to lose than politicians have to lose. The future is what is very critical now. The future for my grandchildren. I'm not even talking about me anymore because I know my age. The future is for my grandchildren in Nigeria. And if my grandchildren, your grandchildren, uh, Dr. Melafia, is not going to have a future, then why? Why must we be the ones that are going to be saying that Nigeria has a future? Where really? Where is the future? All of us that are seated here today, where do we really see the future of Nigeria? There, there, can, there is no future in Nigeria. You look at the wedding that just took place recently in, um, in uh, wherever it took place. And I don't care who is getting married and who is not getting married. But the point is you can't rob this type of thing in people's faces, in people who, you're, who are dying, in people who are, uh, in the faces of people who are hungry. Everybody knows that what is going on in Nigeria is not acceptable anymore. And yet we keep believing that somehow, that we, who is going to come and wave this magic wand that is going to produce peace and equity in 2023? When since 2015, things have gone from bad to worse please let us tell ourselves the truth nigeria there is nigeria does not have a future as a person as an Ijo person i am saying it nigeria does not have a future i have a, a brother who is um uh, the uh, the secretary uh, uh, minister of state rather a petroleum minister of state who is that uh, oil producing telling himself, he's telling himself that two and a half percent is good enough for him and that if somebody else can take 30 percent and go explore for oil in a place called frontier states, when people are dying in Nigeria and they're borrowing money and stealing money anyhow they like. No, 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 no. Please, thank you. I, thank I, I, I'm so exhausted, honestly, in this type of thinking. I'm just so exhausted. Thank you so, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Briggs. Um, Dr. Melafia, before I let you speak, let me call on Mazi Zioko. Um, <coughs> let's, let me so, call on him. So he will just add his comments and you can respond at once. So, uh, Mazi Zioko. All right. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you giving me a chance to speak. <laughs> Uh, the last uh, lady who spoke, everything you said was very clear, very insightful. You know, one thing that I picked up that I, I want to comment on, there are a number of individuals who claimed or at least portrayed themselves as pan-Africanist. 
uh, I think it's I think it's intellectually lazy to say that you're a pan Africanist and that's the reason you believe in one Nigeria. You have to just do a little bit more gymnastics to realize that you can be at the same time pan Africanist and believe in people having the right to self determination. I just think it's intellectually lazy. I also think it's really intellectually dishonest because I'm a PhD in economics from Harvard. So I think it's intellectually dishonest to say that Nigeria as, a, as one entity is a better opportunity than countries that have the ability to function in a much more efficient manner if they got their act together. So anyone coming around and saying, oh, because Nigeria is the largest black nation, how far, how, 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 how far has that gotten us? So um, I think it's intellectually dishonest to say just because Nigeria is a large country, that makes it an economic force. It's not an economic force. It's, it can never be an economic force in its current structure. So th those, are those are two main things. Another thing is that if you look at the age demographics of Nigeria, the vast majority of Nigerians are young people. Why are, why are older individuals deciding the future of Nigeria? Why, why can't you just have a reference? How much blood needs to spill? So if you think that, I just want to make it very clear. If you think that these people that are committing all of these atrocities in Nigeria are doing it because they want to control people. Imagine the person out there that's, you, you have no idea who this person is yet. Imagine the person out there that is fighting for his own freedom. Do you know the lengths that he or she is willing to go? So everyone's sitting around doing an intellectual gymnastic about Nigeria, 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 and it's just words. Realize there are real people out there that have capabilities you have no clue yet to understand that will do whatever it takes in order to get freedom. So I, I'm glad we have a, you know, a quorum of intellectuals that are thinking about the problems of Nigeria, but it, it's, it's only through a referendum that Nigeria and the people of Nigeria will truly be free. If through a legitimate referendum, people come to the conclusion that they want to be one country, fine. But if you, if you, if you, if you continue to beat around the bush and you continue to think that uh, you can force people and trick people and make them think that the only way their future is gonna be realistic is through one country, you're gonna wake up one day and you're gonna realize that some people will do whatever it takes to be free. That's all I have to say. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Let us hear from Dr. Melafia now. Dr. Melafia. Okay. okay, thank you so very much. First of all, uh, Ankyo Briggs, my comrade. She's not just my comrade, she's a sister, you know, someone I greatly respect and admire, a woman of singular courage. I'm very passionate about what she believes in. And uh, first of all, let me just say that actually, I don't think God blocked Ibele Jonathan lost the 2015 elections. He didn't. I don't think so. The elections were systematically rigged against him. Uh, but of course, he, he wasn't vigilant enough. Uh, he appointed a full man to be his principal staff officer, and uh, they did him in. They were one, you know, wearing these things around him, uh, and they, they, they caged him literally. Uh, this ambassador, who was his principal staff officer, Fulani man, and then he handed over the chairmanship of the party to another Fulani man, the former governor of Bochi, and it is has been alleged that in fact he was taking all the money allocated for the campaign and giving it to the APC to the Buhari team. He was working in favor of his Fulani kinsman, not for Ibele and the party that he was chairman of. And then Ibele Jonathan appointed a Fulani man, a professor that he had never met as chairman of INEC. And he also systematically worked against him. So, uh, you know, it's all in the past, but I don't think he lost the elections. And in fact, in any case, he contributed to his own undoing in the end. And there were people you should have gotten rid of uh, in the middle of his administration, and he didn't. 
So, you know, uh, the, the, the regime, the administration became a pastime for grand larceny and, and, and corruption. So this is really what happened. Now, uh, secondly, you say, you know, you said this thing about the middle belt having so many different nationalities. I don't think we should ever overemphasize that. Because truly, what people describe as nationalities are actually more like, you know, clans of other groups. Because if you take most of the tribes, we have up to 20 tribes in Southern Kaduna, most of them understand each other, most of them. The languages are almost interchangeable. Same thing with Plateau State. Many of these languages belong to one family. In fact, there are only three main languages in the whole of the Middle Belt. Niger, Congo, Chadic, and, uh, and Benue Congo. So linguists can categorize all these various groups into those three main language branches. So all these things, uh, we shouldn't you know, actually over, over, overdo it. They are not as diverse as you think. Many of them can understand each other. So thirdly, uh, you know, comrade, uh, you make me quite uncomfortable because I'm someone of a slightly, shall we say, socialist uh, orientation. Uh, I'm a regular, you know, communicator with Socialist International. I'm not a Marxist, but I hold certain socialist views about the welfare of people, the dignity of all people, the, the, the equality of all peoples, and solidarity. These things matter to me. And, uh, you know, and this is a problem I have with some people, particularly in the South. Yes, you acknowledge that the Middle Belt exists. And in the same vein, you insist that Power is a pendulum that should swing between the north and the south. So where do you put the middle belt? Where do you put the middle belt? Since you acknowledge that the middle belt is not part of the north. So it, it, at, at, at one stage, you are happy to categorize everybody as the north, including the middle belt, for purposes of politics. And then it is north versus south. And then you leave the middle belt hanging there like a bat. They say when the bat died, <clears throat> they were looking for his kinsman to come and bury it. They called the birds. The bird came and looked and said, yes, he flies. He's like us. But we don't have a nose. We don't have a mouth like that. And we don't have ears like that. Sorry, mate, he's not ours. They ran away. They called the dog. The dog is, uh -huh, his, his mouth is like ours, his shape like ours, his nose, even his ears. But we dogs, we don't fly. Sorry, he's not part of ours. So there was nobody to bury the, the bat. You are treating middle belt like a bat. Do not forget that middle belt will hold the key to Nigeria, where the bridge that links north and south we are the ones growing all the food you eat. So you can't say power should be a pendulum between North and South. The middle belt must be part of, and we are a swing region. Whichever side middle belt takes, that is the side that will win. Look at the electoral history of Nigeria. So, I mean, it cannot swing from north to south without passing through middle belt. We insist on that. So it is very wrong to just, you know, make this blanket statement. About, and it's not from uh, uh, just you, comrade, I'm hearing. I've heard from most people. When it fits them and it's convenient for them, middle belt doesn't exist. And when they, when they just want to put on their sentimental card, oh, yes, by the way, yes, middle belt. No, no, that's good enough. You can't treat us like that. That's not, that's not good enough. And uh, in fact, I have to be very honest. 
this is what the Northerners are saying. I, I would want to see Indigo in power myself. But what they are saying is that if you are in one breath, you are demanding Biafra, in the other breath, you are demanding presidency. Which one is which among the witches? <laughs> you know, a friend of mine used to speak that kind of language. Which, is, which one is which among the witches? So these are the questions uh, that we all need to be honest with us, with ourselves, you know, to face. Uh, and I think, you know, comrade, you are you are you are you are mistaken here. God, we are all believers. God is Lord of all. God created everything. He created you and me. He created each of people. He created Nigeria. He created everything. In a manner of speaking. But even let us even look at it from the point of view of the sociology of history. And uh, I refer you to the work of Hugh Trevor Rapper, who became Lord Dacre, perhaps one of the greatest British historians of the 20th century. He wrote a book, The Invention of Tradition, in which he was studying Scotland and the rise of Scottish nationalism up to the Enlightenment and beyond. The high, highland upper culture of Scotland and the invention of the Scottish people. And from there, a whole area of research has opened regarding, you know, uh, constructivism, social constructivism. That even, even a job is a construction. Indigo did not exist until the 20th century. That was nothing like Indigo. You meet a man, you say, tell your man, I'm eh? uh, an I'm a Wawa. Um, uh, you, you can't tell him Zidingo. Till today, the Onicha people don't regard themselves like this. So don't mind this Igbo. She told you that I'm an Onicha man. I'm an Onicha man. So even Indigo is a construction based on constructivist theory. Even Yoribala, the Kiriji was. They were fighting bloody wars. Till today, a friend of mine uh, from Ibaland, close to the Alake Spirit, said, don't mind these Yorubas. Igba, Igba is the real thing. You know, Igba, you know, it means all of us together. You know, we gather the people together. That's Igba. He's an Igba nationalist. There's always tension between a Jebu. They say, all of us are Jebu man. And then he's coming here to dominate all your people. After all, your were the warriors. Uh, Alafin is superior, is the number one. Oni is only an Odisha. He's a spiritual head. So there are secondary contradictions. There are sec who tells you that if you have your own Ijo Republic, everybody in Ijo land will agree. You find a lot of other contradictions, perhaps even worse than the ones you've left. Already we are seeing signs. Some of these people in uh, one of the in Ebonyi, they say, hey, you want Biafra what? To go and put us with these Newi people, God forbid, never. These are secondary contradictions. Who tells you that if you break into little pieces, those pieces will still work? They may not. Now, okay, yeah, um, the referendum, good idea. I think I second, I, I agree with that. What do you have the future? Do we have a future? Well, I'm not a prophet. I don't know tomorrow, ma. But I, I, I'm inclined to say that we are the future. This is what Michael Jackson said. We are the people. We are the world. We are the future. The future is what we decide it, sh it should be. There is such a thing as destiny in the life of individuals as well as of nations. But it is also a fact that destiny is what you make of it. Destiny is, my old teacher used to say, character is destiny. Your character will put you before kings or will put you in ignominy. So your destiny, our future is what we make of it. And my position is that, well, what will be, will be. If Nigeria is distinct to, is, was just gridlocked to, to was just imbued to, 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 to misfire, 
and to run aground, maybe that is what will happen. But there have been golden moments in Nigerian history. There have been golden moments, such as winning the World Cup, the beautiful game, such as joining together to fight Ebola. We had such great heroes. And when it calls, when it mattered most, we rose to the occasion. Not everything is so bad about Nigeria. Uh, even though today things are very terrible. But I, I would rather we give it a last shot so that one day it will be recorded that it was not for lack, it was not for lack of trying. Thank and you, Dr. Okay. Sorry, the PIA, the PIA, well, that one, uh, well, you say your brother, the, the Minister of State. I was told half of the eastern, uh, even southern governors were not, mm, legislators were not there. So they voted with their feet. They didn't want to be seen supporting it. It's been even alleged that a lot of money changed hands. If we allowed the Fulanese to outsmart us by using dollars to buy people who like Jacob, like Esau, sold their birthright to their younger brother, Jacob. You don't blame them, you don't blame them. It just means they are smarter than you are. Very sad, but that's the way it is. And uh, my friend, uh, Mazi is your uncle. You know, those of you who live abroad, <laughs> you have a problem. <laughs> You've been so far away that you really don't even understand what is happening here. And uh, some people even attribute their own alienations and project it to what is happening in Nigeria. I'm a village boy. I grew up in a village. And my studies of development have led me to pay very deep interest in rural sociology, what the poor people are doing. Ordinary Nigerians, ordinary Nigerians, in marketplaces, in factories, these are places that I love to visit and observe in farms. There's no difference between Igbo man, Hausa man, Ijoma, Ichekiri man in the marketplace in Nigeria. They are actually very united. They don't see any differences among Dr. themselves. Dr. Yes. Dr. Mila. Yes. Yes. I would have, yes. I would ask you to please kindly yes. summarize because we still okay, have let me summarize. Questions. Yeah, let me summarize. So anyway, thank you. But so uh, if you look at that, Nigerians are more united than you think. Huh? And it is the elites that create and manipulate these fissures and magnify the differences and use them violently to achieve their own goals and uh, uh, their own purposes. And the other point I made too is that, well, please, you are an economist and a very good one. You know, not everybody gets to go to Harvard. Good luck to you, you've done well. But please read your history. I don't think you've read your history enough. Uh, if you did, you wouldn't make those kind of statements. Uh, Indigo cannot be fully Indigo without understanding Igala <laughs> history and spirituality. The Inri, which is the spiritual origin of Ndigo, is from Igala origin. And Igala is in the middle belt. The Onucha ruling house, they are from, uh, they are from Bini, they are Edo people. The house that is Nogu Ashuku, uh, uh, Ngozi Wala's father who died not long ago. He, they are, their real origin is Igala, middle belt. So there has been an intermeshing of all these cultures. Our greatest historians from Afibo to, uh, to uh, Anene, to Jacob Ade Ajayi, to Bala Usman, they will tell you that the, the, the ancient communities of Nigeria were already in a process of state formation and interaction with each other right from the 10th century before the British came in the late 19th century. Uh, you know, so we are in many ways interconnected, much more than, than we imagine. Of course, we can deny it, 
we can. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sure. So, thank you. Due to time, due to time constraints, we don't want to keep you here all night. I know that you no. want to be here all I'll night. I'll Sorry, I'll summarize this time around. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's let's listen to Paul Yusu. Paul. Um. Good, e good, good, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good Please evening. go ahead. Dr. Malafia, my brother, we appreciate yes. you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we met in 2017 at the House of Parliament with Baroness Cox in the course of our struggles yes. for Southern Kaduna and the uh, Plateau State. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, thank you for being here. Uh, just my, my contribution will be a very uh, appreciate uh, Ms. Briggs for her very eloquent and articulation of uh, some of the aspects of our discussion. But I will want to try and keep things to the theme of our discussion this evening, the alignment between the Middle Belt and the South, uh, South, South, Southeast for um, politics, not only towards 2023, but further beyond that. And uh, looking at what Ms. Uh, Briggs said, there is one fundamental aspect that I hold on to there. The moment the South and the Middle Belt decide to come together to understand that we have a common enemy, the game is over. We can begin to solve anything that we have lying in mm -hmm. front of us. Mm -hmm. So I am also uh, a proponent of in, uh, listening to intellectual arguments. So let us try and explore unifying aspect of our history, unifying aspect of our politics, unifying aspect of every cultural, and because history has different fingers. If we go to the wrong direction, we can throw away everything that we have on the table based on that experience. So let us try to uh, articulate and pro project ourselves on factors that will unify us. Having said that, sir, coming from uh, Southern Kaduna like myself, the reason we're having this conversation today is because the South and the Middle Belt have seen the need to have this conversation. We have realized that we need each other. Can you, as a leader, help guide us towards how we in the middle this, uh, lockdown. Oh, you can move uh, because it's an individual now. Uh, you don't move around like that. Sorry, I'm just waiting for someone who is uh, making noise. So, so how, how, how you can help us, people like, uh, to, to guide us so that we in the middle belt can create a common narrative that represents the middle belt so that we can bring to the table of national discourse to help enhance our realization of our goals in terms of alignment with other parts of the country. Mm. And I would also like to ask you, you we have identified as a leader, are you a lone voice in the wilderness or are you working without um, giving away too much of our, uh, 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 the secrets of our strategic, tell secrets of our struggle, are you networking with people so that when certain organizations that are forming, the young people are forming organizations, but they don't have leadership, they don't have guidance. Are you networking with some of our brothers to formulate a group that will give us that leadership so that when organizations in the middle belt have got projects, have got plans and programs that they want to someone to guide them, they can go to. For instance, when we met in the House of Parliament and we were discussing with Baroness Cox about the issues in Southern Kaduna, I did ask her how they can help us. But they said, when we have formulated a program, a plan, we can come and they, they are ready to help us. But when we are trying, uh, a lot of people don't even understand the complexity of our issues in the middle belt. And we are not doing enough to explain ourselves. We may say the same thing about people in the South, but we should be working towards really removing this, uh, uh, what do I call it, uh, historical baggage that we carry about each other and try to look at the issue. We have a common enemy, 
We are in a struggle. What is happening in Nigeria is nothing short of apartheid. And we should sit up and formulate a credible and functional ANC to take our country back. I think that should be our focus. Can you help us to guide us in this direction? Okay. 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 Well, thank you. Yes, thank you so very much, my brother, uh, Dr. Paul Yusuf. I uh, really appreciate you. I have, we haven't seen since uh, that meeting in the House of Lords, uh, you know, very fateful meeting in the House of Lords where I, I gave a, I was called upon to testify. Uh, great time. Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, I think, and Paul has drawn our attention back to what is the agenda really for today that we need to bring together the South and the Middle Belt in order to create a joint narrative about our situation and on the way forward. I think we can't do that successfully without being honest to each other, without being open to each other. Somebody pointed out, I think, uh, you know, is that uh, about our feeling inferior to the South. And I, and I acknowledge that that is a fact, but I also give reasons why the South also have certain attitudes. For example, because everybody in the Middle West speaks Hausa, at one stage they thought we're all Hausas anyway. But you see, when you go to, Kis to East Africa, a lot of people speak Kiswahili. It doesn't, there's only, this is Swahili group in Zanzibar and around Mombasa. It's a very tiny group. But Kiswahili has become like a general language, the market language. The fact that we speak Hausa doesn't mean we are Hausa people. But the South reached that conclusion. Oh, they are all Hausas anyway. They all speak Hausas. Is it because it became a language of convenience because we also have our various ethnic groups. There are so many that which of them will dominate, we don't know. So, but Hausas seemed easy. It was already written down. It's a language of trading, you know, uh, uh, in the streets, apart from English. You know, and at one stage, Yoruba played that role. Even you go to worry, so people speak Yoruba when they are not really Yorubas, you know? They are Koko people in Edo, they are not really Yorubas. They all speak Yoruba anyway, even their Yoruba names. So you can't then therefore jump to conclusion that all of them are Yorubas. So this kind of misunderstanding does crop up, you know. I remember in the 90s, there was a problem in which Igbos were being attacked in Kano and so on. And a pastor from Southern Kaduna was nearly killed. He escaped by jumping through the window. They say he's a, he's a pastor, he's a, he's, a, he's a Christian. They say, onye osa na onye osa, kill him, kill him. Onye osa na onye osa. So these are attitudes that are real. So we need to work on that in order to bridge the gap and reach that understanding. Rome was not built in a day. Unfortunately, our elders in those days understood it better. Namdi Azikiwe, even Ojuku, they were born in Zungeru. Their first language was Hausa. They only went back to Igbo land as teenagers to learn Indi, to learn Igbo language all over again. Their first language that they spoke in life was Hausa language. Will you then jump to the conclusion that Azeki was a Hausa man or uh, 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 Juku was a Hausa man because he spoke Hausa? So it's the same sort of thing. So we need to work on that. And uh, am I a lone voice? No, by no chance. I'm not a lone voice at all. And, uh, uh, and I'm not John the Baptist, who was alone in the lone voice crying in the wilderness. Uh, we've been working in a group. There's a lot of things that are not for public consumption, but I can tell you we are doing um, our homework. And we have reached a very advanced stage of doing our homework. I'm not in isolation. We have groups that we have worked very intensely over the years to articulate the Middle Belt interest and develop and outline a Middle Belt strategy and covers all dimensions of strategy, including possibility of forming an independent country. All these things have been intensely planned and discussed. 
And if we are going to join the South and partner with the South, for us, it is a matter of honor. It will have to be done on the basis of equality and honor and mutual respect or not at all. These are the strategies we've been working on. I am not at all by any means working as a lone, as a lone wolf, if you like. So thank you so very much. Um, thank you. Next question, please. Thank you, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Zomba, please um, kindly mute and unmute yourself. You're, you're causing a lot of distractions. Emmanuel Zomba, um, I think the noise is coming from you. Kindly mute and unmute, kindly unmute and mute yourself back. Um, Justice, Justice Media Podcast, Justice Media Podcast. <laughs> Justice Media Podcast, are you there? Justice Media Podcast, are you there? Justice Media, if you're not there, I am going to move on to the next person. Go ahead, go, Udo. Ahead, go ahead. The, the time Chris is first, Udo, are you there? Chris Udo, I have asked yes. from you. I'm here. Chris Udo is here. Can I go ahead? Please go ahead. Okay. I want to thank Doctor for all the things that he has told us, and they are real. Both the fears both the enemies and everything that he has told us, they are sensible and they are real. Thank you. But I need to bring something to the attention of uh, Dr. Melafia. Uh, you, you talk about what happened in, uh, in 1804 to 1808, which is the history of what led us to where we are today. When Uthman Danfolio first uh, landed in a place that was Sokoto then, and now used that as a launch pack to now take over the entire north, except Borono. He was not alone. The Fulanis have actually, over the years, outsmart, outsmarted everyone in the sense that. They never won any battle. That is the truth. They used the indigenous, the people from that land, to win the battle. I still remember 1967, 1970 war. I was very small, but the picture is still right here with me. Middle belts by that time were used. Gowon was used. Gowon is alive today. We need to hear. We need to hear from him. What happened? He need to tell us where it is necessary. He needs to apologize because he is one of those that have led us this far into this problem. Then uh, today we have all seen what is going on. All the appointment of service chiefs, representative in the UN, the World Court, uh, recruitment. They are all being tailored towards the Fulanis, and everybody just keep quiet. All of us have representative in the house. We have representative in the military. We have representative in DSS, EFCC, policymakers, the Senate, House of Representatives. Have we started to talk to our people? Tomorrow, DSS can come after me. It's not a Fulani that will be sent. It is my own people that will be sent. So I think we have a duty to begin to talk to our people who are in government and outside government. And somebody did mention referendum. Who is going to give you an opportunity for a referendum? Is it the United Nations or the present government? Let's forget it. You will not get 
and nobody will get it. But what I know is that if we decide today and say we are going to be free, we are going to be free. Uh, for your information, I come from Ibo People's Republic. I'm no longer in Nigeria. So, sir, how do we stop the Fulanis from using our people to wage war against us? Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, do I respond? Hello. Um, Chris Doe, thank you so much. But I'll ask um, Justice Media Podcast to actually make your comment before Dr. Malafia because okay. most of what you just mentioned have been discussed already and we don't have time to keep repeating the same thing over and sure. over again. Sure. Um, yes, thank Justice you. Media Podcast. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we yes. can hear you. Please go ahead. All right. First of all, I want to thank... Uh, uh, Dr. Malafia, um, you have given a very um, important, um, made an important statement today, which elated my heart. And uh, by way of introduction, I'm a cleric. I'm an Anglican priest. I live in, in Ohio, in the US. And um, look, looking back to what is going on in Nigeria, we, we all, we all listening here, must understand one thing, that I'm not a prophet of doom. Nigeria is irredeemable. I stopped praying for Nigeria. Listen, I'm talking as a cleric. I stopped praying for Nigeria in 2019. The only, I'm an Igbo person as well. The only people that I pray for is the ethnic Nigeria, all the ethnic nationalities in Nigeria is what I am praying for every day of my life. And I will continue to pray because whatever thing that we are doing, in quotes, I use quotes as Nigerians, is based on our ethnicity. I want to go back a little bit. If you look, I have been opportune to travel. I lived in China for three years. And I see how China works. And when there was uh, a riot that, that you know, happened in 2007, I was one of those that called the, one of those guys that is still around, uh, what is his name again, I, I forgot. He works with, uh, in, in, in uh, Beijing. He has to fly in from Beijing. I was one of the people that was able to calm the nerves of Nigerians because they marched on the street of China. It has never happened before. The Chinese government brought out their, their ammunition, everything to shoot. I was one of them that stood up and said, please, we can resolve this thing. Let's back out a little bit. And we did, and things were resolved because wherever you go as a Nigerian, they will hunt you down. And our embassies cannot do nothing. Last year, I went, I came to Nigeria. I have to come in with a visa because for one year, I was going for my expired passport. I don't use the Nigerian passport anymore. If I'm coming to Nigeria, I'm coming in as, as a visitor in my own country. Come on, let's, let's, let's be realistic here. But, I mean, with due respect, sir, Dr. Mylafia, I know... You have a whole lot in your hands. And it beats my heart. It pains me so much that people from your area is being in this kind of situation uh, that they are. Every day you will hear 30 people killed, 20 people killed, 15 people killed. These are not water. This blood is flowing in their veins. Not only in North Central, it's everywhere in Nigeria. It is irredeemable. What is the way forward? Because whatever thing we are talking about here or whatever anybody is saying here, what is the way forward? According to what you're saying, how to bridge the gap to the north, uh, sorry, uh, the middle belt and uh, the south. Mm -hmm. Handshake across the Niger. Something like that has happened before. 
But who are the people? He's been, he was sabotaged. That guest job was sabotaged because according to the last person that spoke, he was saying that, look, whatever you like it or not, there are people there in our states or in our local government and everywhere, our politicians, which are the problems, they will always find them uh, willing to, to do what they want to do. Now, if you look at Europe, you see that Europe is divided according to their tribal entities. And now some of them become European Union. If you go to Germany, they, they speak Dutch. If you go to France, they speak French. They are in EU, right? They fought before they were able to come together and do this, the way forward. If, this is my opinion, if, and only if, when the so-called Mama Briggs, uh, with due respect, Niger Delta, Southeast, Middle Belt, Southwest, the Yorubas, if these four groups should come together and say, we want a referendum, it will happen. Whether they like it or not, they will give it to us. Because what we are talking about is, look, I am, I am almost 50 years old. I'm almost 50. Next year, I'll be 50 years. We are talking about our children, not us. We can fight this war. Our children cannot, in the midst generation, they cannot fight this war. They can never do it. When you look at, when you go to the to, uh, uh, social media, what will you see? They will be twerking, showing themselves up. It looks like they don't even know what is going on in Nigeria. The man that shake the, the, the cabal that is helping, having that hegemony against every ethnic nationality, the naval officer that spoke and said, yes, we know this is happening and this is the agenda. We all know the agenda. Why are we still talking? We should be put, put in action. Mr. Justice Media. Hello, Mr. Justice okay. Media. Um, um, yes. Augusta, one second. Uh, Dr. Melafia, may I ask, please, how, how long do you, will you want to stay further with this interview? It's fine. I'm asking. Ahead. Okay, it's are fine. you here? Because, because oh, I'm asking I because we I would to like conclude. to have, uh, uh, please, Mr. Jossi, need one second. We would like to have at least 30 seconds offline conversation so that we want to schedule it very well. So okay. that you wouldn't get tired asking sure, questions sure, and then sure, you wouldn't sure. have time for such okay. conversations while sure. we conclude. So, Second and then uh, please, okay. yeah, we will ask everyone who will comment henceforth, please keep your comments within two, two minutes so that uh, our guests will not be exhausted. He's okay, here two minutes. At, at I'll, I'll round up in a, in a minute or two. So I Thank want you. to put this to Dr. Mylafia and up. every other person, every other person that is here listening. The only way we can forge ahead is to start speaking directly to all the politicians in our constituencies. Yeah. Speaking directly to them to give us that opportunity to speak at the National Assembly, both the lower house and the upper, the Senate, that we need a referendum. Let, it, it takes one person to say we need Nigeria. Enahoro, he gave that proposal and Nigeria became what it is in court. But they didn't give us the, the, the right foundation to forge a nation. We are not a nation yet. The only way we could have a nation is to make sure that this referendum comes, the, the middle belt and people coming down towards the southeast, south, south and all that will form a larger force. When that happens, Thank you so that much. referendum will happen in two in, 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 in just a twinkle of a night. So I'm putting Thank it to you. you. Yes, I'm putting it to you to, sir, to do what you can. I will be praying for you. I will be praying for you. My congregation will be praying for you. And every other person that is going to make sure that the next generation, we, we, we leave something for them. We, are go we must have to die for something. Media. God bless you and thank Podcast. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to call on the next person now. Um, Dr. Wei Jigwe, please, okay. I'll ask 
you to please yes very brief yeah, yeah yeah very brief because they've uh, contributed uh, most of the things um i'm supposed to talk thank you dr mylafia for your kind thank exposition you. yeah thank um you. first of all i have a question to ask but i want to base the quest, uh, those two questions will be predicated on two events. First, Nzogu's coup, you know, coup statements. And then Okas, Didion Okas coup statements. You find that Nzogu was directed on the politicians, those we call prof political profiteers. And then Oka was pungently, you know, he pungently directed his case on the Fulani domination, what we are suffering now. And I recommend people to read these two, take time to read these two uh, cool statements. And these are the major problems we have today. We have elected officers, senators, governors, all of them. The people will be doing something, the Fulani, and their armed men will be killing their people. They will just be there in the National Assembly, in the State Houses of Assembly, ministers, or whatever, with their police around them, sharing money. They don't feel anything about it. Now, these are the major two problems, you know, the major problems we have. The politicians and the Fulani people. These are two major things. Because I believe that if one cannot be effectively Soft without the other being tackled. How do we? Because the easiest key to the solution of the planet problem now is to call our politicians to order. Because I know if our elected members, if the whole member, if the whole senators in the south today decide to boycott the proceedings, or the whole members of the, 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 let me say the National Assembly, if they decide to boycott the proceedings on account of the insecurity of the town, I don't think this government, you know, will continue to act with impunity or blind eye or deaf and dumb over the, you know, the security problem. We are not talking of, we are not talking of Middle Belt South coalition. How do we bring these, our politicians, on their knee? Because these are the people who have the ability to discourage, to discourage the down the masses, intimidate them with the available security around them, and also entice them with their ill-gotten work. How do we manage this? Because these are our major enemies now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so very much. Okay, Dr. Dr. Melasia, Dr. Melasia, yes. I'll just call on one more question and then I'll allow you to uh, okay. just react sure. and comment the sure. Mr. Felix Oti, Mr. Felix Oti. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Melafia, it has been a pleasure mm -hmm. listening to you. Thank you. And every other person that had uh, spoken. Because of today's uh, program, I had to catch up on the goings on in Plateau State. I, I did a lot of reading this morning up to the afternoon when the program started. And uh, I came across a lot of things because I'm narrowing it to what is happening in Plateau State because I was in Plateau State the last time was in 2001. And if you remember, uh, there was a major crisis. I had to run from Plateau State back to Benue State because of an issue uh, of killings. It kind of surprises me that uh, these problems have not been solved. Even when you go back to the times of uh, Solomon La as governor, we had issues then before Solomon La, all of that time, 
I have family in Jos. I still have family in Jos for over 50 decade, decades they're there. All the things I read today seem to point to uh, four reasons why we have all these killings, recurring killings, dating back to uh, as far as I can remember. You have religious killings, you have economic situations that seem to be, uh, uh, there seem to be a, a economic disparity among some tribes. And uh, you have the ethnicity issue between the Hausas and the Biram. You have discrimination, uh, the so-called indigenous and non-indigenous uh, status. And then of course the reprisal attacks, which you kill me today, tomorrow I'll retaliate and all of that and all of that. And this has been going on for a very long time. You have the major tribes, the Biram, the Anagutu and the Afizera people. My question is this, having known these things and having known the extent of these problems, why is it that the problem 30 years ago is still the problem today and probably will be the problem 20 years from today. What are these ethnic groups and the so-called settler groups? What legitimate or genuine effort are they making to ensure that since this problem has already been discovered, to ensure that a solution, a lasting solution is found so that all these killings, 1,700, 260 some, I mean, I kept so many numbers today that I, I just could not contain myself. What are the politicians and the military and the leaders and all of these people doing to solve this 100 year problem? Let me just put it as 100 years. That is my question. Thank you. Okay. Um, just before we let Dr. Mela here reply, I would ask that if your, con if your hand is up just for a comment, please keep it to the comment section. And maybe after um, we stop recording and we start the informal chat, you can now make your comments. But if it's a question, then you can keep your hand up. Dr. Mela here. Thank you, sir, very much, Augusta. I have here questions from three people. First is Chris Udo. And I agree with him that, uh, yes, the Fulanis never really won any wars. Uh, they normally go and use and manipulate local fifth columnists to do their dirty work for them. And it's not that they've never won wars. Really, they have never built anything. Have you ever heard of a Fulani civilization in which the Fulanis built wonderful edifices that they are known for, like the carvings of Ilefe, like the Beni bronze, like even the Nok civilization. You've never heard anything civilization built by these people. They are just good at blackmailing and taking over what others have built over centuries. So yes, I agree with him. And in Ari Lauren, for example, they used a local chieftain, uh, Afonja, and then uh, the Aro and Naka Kamfo, uh, you know, was deceived into aligning with them and eventually they killed him and took over. How do we stop the Fulanis? Well, to be honest with you, I said that there must be a principle of self-defense that all communities in the Middle Belt and in Nigeria and the South should adopt principle of self-defense. Defend your family, defend your community, defend your land with everything that you have. And don't take chances in doing that. Well, is, well I've heard this about, said about Gawon and uh, a lot of mistakes were made in those days. Gawa genuinely believed 
that he was fighting a war to keep the country together. And there was a clash of egos between him and Ojuku. Again, that's a problem, eh? Ojuku was born with a silver spoon. He was a prince. His father was the richest man in Nigeria. I still, when I went to Oxford as a student, there were very senior professors who knew him as a classmate, as a schoolmate. They even told me he was the only one, the, the only student on campus with a Rolls Royce, which I later found out to be true. So he was born with a silver spoon. He was well educated. He went to King's College Lagos. He slapped a senior, senior master, a white man. So they expelled him from the school and he went to Lansing College, private boarding school in England, from there straight to Oxford. So he had a certain sense of entitlement. But you see, a lot of people underestimate middle belt people. And you do so, with a, it becomes a grave mistake. He so go on as his inferior. Gowon was a son of a, an Anglican evangelist, which in the Anglican communion in the North, Gowon's father is revered as a saint. He was a very holy man. Gowon to, went to Barewa College. It was the Eton of the North. Government College, Zaria. He was senior prefect, was college captain, was football captain, was boxing champion, he was the best runner in the school. He was the best high jumper in the school. He wanted to read engineering or medicine, but the schoolmaster told him, look, you have this commanding charisma. Go into the army. That's how he went to Teshi. From Teshi, he went to Sandhurst. Ojuku underestimated him, saw him as a bush boy from the backwaters. But he underestimated him. And Gowon doesn't talk much but he has the heart of a lion and he doesn't forgive. Well, I'm saying, I know he's a Christian, he forgives. But if you hurt him, he doesn't forget it. And he waits for his time to take, take you on. So their, their enmity became very personal, very sad. These are facts on, on ground. And, uh, and Ojuku didn't run there for very long. To run it as a personal estate. That's why he killed people who disagreed with him. He executed them. And uh, so, was, the, was Biafra run as a democracy? That's an issue. I don't think you can you say Gowon was just misled and just used. There was an element of that. But Gowon was 31, he was a bright young man. Uh, he believed genuinely that the country needed to be saved. And, uh, and then uh, he had international support for it. There were a lot of issues. When they were called for to be settled by Emperor Haile Selassie, at one of those meetings, it is reported by one of the retired ambassadors, who was a young man as a diplomat there. The meeting was for 9 o'clock. Ojuku came around almost 12. He kept them waiting till 12. Immediately he walked, walked in, he, he sat down and just stretched his hand behind him, his head gave him his cigarettes. He lit a match, started blowing the cigarette into Gowon's face. So the president of Liberia at that time, uh, President, uh, what is his name again? The president of Liberia, a very old man at that time. He turned around and told everybody, you this young man, would you have you ever been told manners? Have you been taught manners? Did your parents teach you manners? So Oju could behave in a way that could never win the sympathy of anybody. And that is the tragedy of Biafra. Unfortunately, also, Gowon resorted to, to uh, enforced, to force recruitment of young people from middle age. Many of them underage. Some of my uncles were underage. 16 years, 15 years, oversized boots, take them to the forest. They have never seen a forest before. 
And please let the records be very clear. More Northerners died in Biafra than Biafrans. That is a statistical fact. It is just that there were so many of them. You mean the soldiers of, you mean soldiers, Northern yes. soldiers or Northern civilians? No, I said Northern soldiers. Good. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Northern, more Northern soldiers died. That is, a, that is a mathematical fact. Most of them were enforced, enforced recruits. They had never seen the terrain. They were wiped out like, like grass. They had never seen a forest before. This is statistical fact. Of course, more in the end died in Biafra because of starvation and all of those things, which was very tragic, very sad. I don't condemn, condone it. I have condemned it in all my writings. And I've also said that there will never be real peace in Nigeria until we repent to Indigo for the crimes we have committed against them. But let's be very honest and truthful to ourselves. Let's not hide behind prevarications and pretense. That will not help anybody. So on the UN, somebody, I think you mentioned the UN, the UN can never stand for Nigeria, never. Why? Because the number two in the UN system is a Fulani woman. The president of the General Assembly, the Nigerian permanent representative and the president of the General Assembly is also another Fulani man. And they were strategically placed there to make sure that any topic on genocide in Nigeria, it is shut down. And until recently, the chief prosecutor was a, was a Muslim woman from the Gambia. She studied in Nigeria, went to University of Lagos went to law, Nigerian law school. She knows Nigeria in and out. She was totally on the side of the Fulanese and was not sympathetic to us. So you can understand why anything Yorubas, Biafra, right to North Africa, when it reaches the number two, she will now throw it in the dustbin. It will never reach the Secretary General of the UN. Never, never reach. So anyway, Justice Media, Justice Media, well, thank you so much. Uh, I, 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 as, a, as a man of God, I think you should never be tired of praying. Uh, you should continue to pray for Nigeria. I don't think why you should not. Uh, you remind me of a friend of mine who 25 years ago, as a young man, he's from Yoruba, I think he's from Ogunu, a very dear friend of mine. He tore his passport. He decided, took scissors caught his Nigerian passport and threw it in the dustbin and vowed nothing will ever associate him with Nigeria again. He will never visit Nigeria. He will have nothing to do with Nigeria. He swore. Fair enough. He got married to a young woman. He qualified as a solicitor. He's doing very well as a commercial solicitor. And, uh, and then he married a white woman, an English girl. They had two kids. When their daughter turned 18, uh, and she, they live in Manchester, when the daughter turned 18, before she went to university, she insisted that her father must take her to where he came from. And that was about seven, eight years ago. I was living in Nigeria. He then called me. I had to now write a letter inviting him as a foreigner so that he could now go and get a visa. And that was what happened. He and his family came on a visa, which I invited them, uh, you know, uh, and uh, they had a wonderful time. After about a month in Nigeria, lo and behold, his two children and his wife, though you both woman, they said, Daddy, you can go back to your England. We shall prefer it here. You, you can go. We will go. We will prefer to remain here. I am telling you. So, and they now the children, the only compromise you could reach to them is that every year they must come back to Nigeria. So the father now had to agree to that. So Nigeria is an intoxicating phenomenon. You love it, you hate it, but this is Nigeria. And it is the place for now that we call our home. We can either decide to make it work 
But we can decide that we hate it so much that we want it to die and die very fast. But I'm always a realist and a philosophical realist. Uh, and uh, conservatism in the line of people like Edmund Burke is not to rush to change anything that you cannot put something better in its place. And we have no guarantees that the little petty, nation, the petty nations we are trying to create will be better. And I've said it that there are always secondary contradictions. Not that Indigo are so united. If you see how they fight each other, Indigo would have been ruling Nigeria for a long time if only they were united. But everyone is a king in his own OB. Nobody wants to sit to the other. And the Fulanese know that. They know that. They just play those games and then Indigo will just scatter, scatter. And they will never be united. And unless Indigo are united, getting the presidency will remain very, very difficult. Especially if they have torn courts like hopeless Uzodima. And they say, he calls himself hope. I call him hopeless Uzodima or Okorocha. All those people, these are political jobbers and political gamblers. They are a far cry from the highly educated people that ruled people land. As a young man, teenager, I used to go and stay with the late Dr. Akanu Ibia in his hometown in Afiko, Uwana, his village is called Uwana in Afiko. What a great man. Those people, oh, hopeless, oh, hopeless, oh, Zodima, oh, Korocha, all these old, they cannot even polish his shoes. They are not fit to polish that man's shoes. I swear to God Almighty. These are the, the giants that ruled Igbo land, that were in Igbo land as, as, as statesmen. And then you have this, these Nikon poops that are ready to sell their mothers, sell their fathers, sell their everything. So Igbo, please do some soul searching. Now, uh, so that's all for, and then one call, why is it, why is it, why is it, have a very strong name. Yeah, you mentioned Zogu, Oka. If we boycott the elections, I don't think it will work. This is not England or America where they have moral qualms. These people have no more, they have no conscience. In fact, they will celebrate. Ah, they've left it for us, they've left it for us. They never, since they have no morality, they have no ethics. It will mean nothing to them. And by the way, Britain is ready to support them if they do that. Britain is willing to support them. So I don't think it will work. Instead, we should strategize collectively, fight our corner, and ensure that what we want is what we prevail in the near future. And then Felix OT, plateau problem. Well, it's a long problem. You mentioned things like uh, uh, indigen, uh, settler, Biron people. Please, sir, I think you are reading too much of Google. If you read too much of Google, it will mislead you completely. Find other sources other than Google because a lot of Google is garbage in, garbage out. I will tell you. The nature of just problem. Just people don't know that the actual meaning of the word just is Jesus our Savior. The missionaries that came and settled in Jos at the turn of the last century, I mean by the late 19th century, and uh, around 1902, I still have pictures. Some of the old missionaries that settled there. Their great grandchildren came back, stayed in my house in Abuja some years back. And they showed us pictures of the first plane that landed in Hepang Airport around 1902, 1903. Jaws had electricity before the city of London because of the tin mining that had gone on there for almost 80 years. So a lot of things were, and the first people that settled in Jaws outside the indigenous were ethic and Ibibio people. 
Calabar Essex Ibibio. Then the Ogomo shop people came before the Hausa people came. Then the military with their shenanigans decided to create just not local government where the Muslims, are, the Fulanis are predominantly settled in the hope that a Fulani Muslim would become the chairman of their local government. The military under Babangida created that mischief. A, a bureau man called Pam Dung cannot go and be chairman of a local government in Kano. Or oh, a Langtang man called uh, Selbut Mantong cannot go to Katina and claim chairmanship of a local government. Because after chairman, they will claim emirate right and other things. That is the source of the problem. Because indigenous settler is not only a problem in uh, plateau. Why should that of plateau become violent? The constitution of Nigeria recognizes indigenous. That is why people have indigenous forms. You need even indigenous certificate. If I go today to settle in Enugu, a place I love so much. I love Enugu people. I don't know why. I just like them. I like to go to Enugu and spend some time. But no matter how long I stay in Enugu, I will be a settler. I will not be an indigenous. And I will not take offense. But the Hausas not only want to take offense, they want to be the ones to rule and call the shots. And once they take over that local government, they want people, illegal immigrants from Chad, from Mali, from everywhere, they'll be trooping in and they'll be giving the indigenous because the chairman has the right to issue indigenous certificates. That is why the just problem has become. Why is it that the first settlers, the ethnic, the BPO, Later, the Igbos and the uh, Obama Shaw and Yorubas, they are not fighting. Why are they? Why is it only the specific people are fighting? They are fighting because they see that Joss is the spiritual headquarters of the Middle Belt. There's a religious dimension, there's a jihad dimension to the whole thing. And then, of course, they are using ethnic camp. Today, they'll say it's Biro. The tomorrow they say it's Afizere. The next day they say it's uh, uh, Rukuba. The next day they say it's Miango. They are pitching tribes against each other and it is all the same thing. The Fulani is. And I'll tell you what happened last week. For the past three weeks, they had been killing people, over three, 400 people in Miango, Rukuba. They were being killed. Then the other Saturday, they, they were going for mass burial. The Rukuba people, they are going to mass burial of I think about 60 or 70 percent of their people, they are going to be buried on that day. Then they saw a strange bus coming in through the bush path. So the youth stopped the bus and there was an ambulance in front of it. So they started interrogating them. They said they are Yorubas and they just went for an Islamic conference in Bauchi. They are heading on their way back to Ondo State. So the youth asked them, ah, if you are heading to Ondo State, this is a bush path. Is it the road to Ondo State? The main highway passes through Jostown behind, if you like, and passes through, through Bukuru. You go, that is how you go to Ondo State. Why are you following this bush path if you are truly going to Ondo State? No, we must search this vehicle. When they opened the, the, the ambulance, they saw massive military hardware. They opened the bus, they saw people with guns and everything. So katakata started. And I think they killed, the youth killed about 60 of them. Now the propaganda is that innocent Yorubas were coming from Bauchi after a religious conference, they were going to Ondo and they killed them. When they released the list, none of the names was Yoruba. They were all Fulanese. And don't forget some years back, the Biron people were going for a mass burial like that. And you know, this part is so funny, so heartless. They will not even allow people to mourn their people. They went to Kuru during the mass burial ceremony. The mass was taking place. They went to the mass and killed so many people, including a serving senator, Senator Danton, who was a consultant surgeon. And he was the head of the Joss Mission Hospital, uh, Vom Christian Hospital before. 
decided to go into politics. A serving senator was killed, and a member of the House of Reps also was killed. So the youth said, ah, this thing happened some years ago, so they want to come and repeat the same thing during this mass barrier. We will not agree. Then they started fighting, and they killed 60 of them. It is good for people to under. People even call me and say, ah, why did you youth? This, these are innocent people. These are Yorubas. I don't condone killing at, at all. But this is actually what happened. They were not innocent people. They were not coming from any religious festival. They were, they were, <coughs> they were not Yorubas, and they were not going to own those states. They were Fulanis, and they were there on a mission. And John, that the youths waylaid them and were the first to fire the shots. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Mazezo, can you? Yes, um, Dan, um, you know, I think uh, we'll be rounding up now, but uh, before we do, um, Melafia, once more, uh, good evening and um, welcome. And, uh, good evening, it's been, sir. It's been a pleasure listening to you. And, um, Thank you. Uh, I have a very simple question. You know, you, you said that you believe in Nigeria, and at the same time, um, noted that Nigeria is not working. That's a contradiction. Now, you condemned those proposing 1963, you know, a revert to something similar to 1963 uh, structure where there was regional governance. Yes, I do understand that it was north, which included the Middle Belt. And obviously, the Middle Belt doesn't want to be part of that north. Now, and in this room, we have people also yearning for referendum. But you are leaving us, apart from saying you want one Nigeria, you are leaving your audience with no concrete proposition as to way forward. Now, my question to you is, if you're saying those who say 1963 with current realities, meaning it could be six, eight, 12 regions, it doesn't matter. I mean, there is no way if we say we revert to 1963, uh, um, you know, sort of arrangement where we had three regions. Today, by geographical uh, connotation, we already have um, six. Again, I am also aware that Middle Belt does not equal North Central. Bearing that in mind, that means there could be an arrangement or an agree uh, or a sort of agreement and recalibration of the structure where for instance uh, there are people from Ebony that are in uh, in Benue and there are people of Igbo that are in in, in Delta this is the the Anoma, for instance where you can reconfigure in order to fit the current realities because structures are made for the people who are alive and not for those who have gone so if mistakes were made in the past, that's, that's fine. But here is, how do you think what the people, because we can't continue, one thing is very clear. Nigeria, can, we cannot continue the way it is. It does not work. Therefore, you know, if someone like me, I, I think if, if there is a way to go regional, to give everybody chance to develop at their own pace, that is what I would, you know, um, obviously, uh, support and at the same time you made mention of uh, self-determination but you didn't drive much into it isn't that something also the middle belt probably should consider thank you well thank you very very much Marzi is it okay and I, 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 I appreciate the questions you've asked but number one Please get it very clear. I never said I believe in Nigeria. Nor did I imply that I believe, quote unquote, in Nigeria. While at the same time, I am acknowledging that Nigeria doesn't work. Perhaps I didn't make myself clear enough. It is not for me to believe or not believe. Uh, we have a ramshackle edifice that we call our country we have a choice to try to make it work or to decide that it's not gonna work, it's not, it's not worth anybody's bother. 
my my belief, whether I believe in Nigeria or not, I, I think I, I am inclined to think that we ought to do our utmost to make it work with or without the Fulanis. I've said that statement many times. So it is not about whether I believe in Nigeria or not. We, we have a reality on ground. And uh, I believe God doesn't play dice with the universe, that we didn't exist as a mistake. If a mother gave birth to a wayward child, it's still her child, you know? Even if the whole world called this, call this a bastard child, it's still her child. So it is up to us to make the country work. The country will call our home until we've tried hard enough and we know before God and before humanity that we have tried and it has never worked. Then we give up. And number two, well, you said I didn't posit any way forward. Well, this is not a lecture. Uh, I wasn't told that this is a lecture, so I never approached it as a lecture. Uh, I responded to questions asked. Nobody asked me what is the way forward. Nobody asked me that question. If you did, I would have told you what the way forward is. Okay, sorry, dear. May, may, may well, I add that okay. as an idea? Number one, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, indeed. If you ask me the way forward, the way forward for me is to have eight regions. Four in the north, four in the south. Let me explain. Northeast, Northwest, Middle Belt East, Middle Belt West, Western Nigeria, Midwest, Eastern Nigeria, and Niger Delta region, including Aquaibo Rivers and Elsa. Uh, that gives you four in the north, four in the south. And it makes for equity. It makes for equity. And secondly, we can keep the, the division of, in terms of the, the, the way, the allocation of responsibility and authorities for the regions. I like that idea, but not the structure of the 1963 constitution, but the way you know, it, it devolved authority, devolution of authority and responsibility should go from federal more to the regions. That I like very much. And I prefer an executive parliamentary system. This executive presidency is too expensive. Let's have an executive parliamentary system. That is to say, a prime minister uh, with executive powers, and uh, if you like, with a ceremonial president that is rotated. And I think the principle of rotation is implicit in our constitutional conventions. Implicit in the sense that when we saw is the turn of the North, is the turn of Yoruba, is the turn of Indigo, is the turn of this, we are implicitly saying that we recognize the principle of rotational executive. So let us put it in the constitution that the president, the parliamentary uh, prime ministership will rotate between all these eight regions. It will rotate between these eight regions. In Switzerland, they do it a year. You spend a year, off you go. The next province takes over. Thank you. Say it should be a year. I would say it should be something like, you know, four years. Thank you, Dr. Melafia, so that we, I, I think you've that addressed that question. Let's quickly take the rest of the questions and then round up. Let's just allow these um, six hands up to just two, two, two minutes, and then we, we we round the discussion up. Let's start from the top. Bro Chidera, please. And then Mr. Jacobs, and then down like that. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Good evening from here. Hello, good evening, sir. How are you, brother Chidera? Well, thank God, sir. Sir, um, well, my time is very little, but I have a lot of questions to you. Number one question is that, knowing full all that you know, yet you stick in one Nigeria. Why? Sir, is Middle Belt and the South have not died enough? What is it so special in this Nigeria in particular? 
I'm 37 years old. When I applied my passport to come to this country, the receipt given to me by immigration says 6,000 Naira, and I paid 30,000, but the official was 6,000. Sir, listening to you several times an interview give us hope. But the change of tune these days, is it because of the DSS invitation to you? Did anybody harass you to lower down your voice? Sir, no evil on you, no, sir, with all due respect. You, 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 you were well an adult far before Abiola was died. He's from South. You know Denegua, he's from South. You know um, Ghana, he's from the Middle Belt. You know Namdekano, he's from the South, he's Southeast. You know um, uh, Sunday Boho, he's from South. Everything that happens is from South. All the blood is from the South and the Middle Belt. Not, not, not in blood that are not are dying also, but not are dying, but they choose to keep quiet. Why did I say to you, sir? During the end SARS, you saw in end SARS, the, the lot of leaders are telling their brothers that they should stay where they are. That is the purpose of the NSAS is made to overthrow Buhari. Why everybody in this country know for sure that the brutality of the SARS are completely out of hand? No one tolerated that. Sir, you are from Middle Belt. Governor Autumn is a very good example. I is the only governor among the 35. You heard what he said recently, that he's spoken to the man leading you people in that nation. And he stated clearly that he want uh, an open grazing. When he tried to convince him, said, what are you going to be doing with the people that this particular, whatever you are saying is completely out of line because about 40 million when this was done, now it's over 200 million. People have built houses in those areas. He said, no, those who have included that area will be removed. Sir, you are quite well educated. And you know for sure that this pre present pre uh, government have told us that these people are foreigners. You people continue saying, not to you, but just an example that Nigeria is indivisible. But this nation called that they are preaching out that indivisible allow foreigners to invade us. All the way from Southern Cardinal, last year the heat was done on them. Very, very on on them. I have heard so many cry. What is it that you, a lead, are so confident and comfortable and stay quiet? Have Nigeria not died enough in you people's hand? I'm not directing to you, but the question should be answered by because you represent quite a lot. Nigeria may be well favored you, but how about us that want to come home? We really want to bring what we have gained here to come and invest it. I can't. I can't do that because the system did not allow it. As I'm here, I cannot land in my state in any direct until I go through custom searching and so on. I wouldn't go on, I wouldn't want to, but you can remember all my questions. In conclusion, sir, what exactly is that? Because you just proposed now eight region. If this eight region is excluded Flanis that you have told us in this forum now how brutal they are, how unforgiving they are, what they did to the people of uh, Benue State, we have not forgotten. What they do to our people in Agatha, we have not forgotten. It is only many, many, many we can count on. Yet you came here to propose to us eight region. What is difficult from uh, Middle Belt to join us? You know, looking at you here now, you look more like Mazes. Okay, did the Mazes okay look like you, like a, a Flani person? You sure. more, we, my, we are more comfortable staying with you than those who want to sword to say they must take our life and take our land, which the president spoken person has said, either your land or your death, yet you want to keep us there. We are saying you no. Know, he said, which is which is which? My brother, this yes, conversation will not end today. Let's hear Thank someone you. else. Thank you very God much. You, um, uh, Mr. God Jacob, Mr. Jacob, please. Mark Jacob, Beatrice Simon, unmute yourself. Otherwise, why be NDK? Please rename your device for me to call you. I need to know your full name. Adesa, please. Mazi Ezeluchie, please. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right, okay. go ahead, Adesa. 
Can you hear me? I just go ahead now. Okay. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to our honorable man on the platform. Uh, the only thing I want to ask is that why is it that uh, why is it that we don't look? We are we are we uh, we are shy away of putting equal equal hand on the table with this government. Like based on my own critical analysis about this government, I'm thinking that they only believe in someone that comes to the table with a ham, with somebody that is able to show them that look, I can vandalize the country economy like the Niger Delta did, or I can I can cause a chaos that we affect the coming in of uh, revenue to the government, then they can negotiate. I realize that the South are always on the street. Like, uh, they don't want anything to, to tarnish their image. They are always on the protest. But when you look at the Boko Haram, the ISWAP, the, 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 the people that are stealing the kidnapper, the robbed, all these people that are in the North, that are doing all these things, the government, seems, the federal government, seems to be able to negotiate with them or send an insider to them to plead with them, to talk to them. Whereas when you see people that say they want to just put a play card on a street, they are not even disturbing the traffic. They come with the mighty harm of the government. People that are just maybe doing protests. That is what happened in the East, where Apple become a, uh, Apple almost become a monster in their hands. What they did, so I'm asking our honorable gentleman, can he look, can he take a critical look and think that because these people we call the Northerners, or to be honest with you, everyone above Kwara, uh, Enugu, and uh, Kogi, I call them Northerners. It's recently, I started start differentiating them before they all, because I realized um. that um, Mr. Adifa, um, with, with respect, I think most of these questions are basically saying the same thing. So if they are, if they are saying the same thing, let's just round up and have another discussion. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me round it up in this way. What I want to ask our honorable gentleman is that, should we, use, should we look at another aspect? Instead of trying to pretend, should we come with a hand on the table? So that the government can understand we really need this work. Forget All about right, the referendum, you. forget about any other thing. All right, well, thank you. Mazia Zeluche, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. Dr. Malefa, thank you for hosting us um, to, for being part of this process. My thank question you. relates to what has happened, uh, what is going on in Afghanistan, and um, the likelihood of a similar occasion taking place in Nigeria. Um, the, if you look at the, uh, the um, if you compare both instances, um, Afghanistan, the state uh, had over 350,000 uh, soldiers and the Taliban had about 75,000. But because the military and armed institutions in Afghanistan had been infiltrated by Taliban, it was easy for the Taliban to overrun the system. Now, that question in Nigeria, do you foresee, considering that the military and all the armed forces have been made in such a way that they're headed by this same clique the Fulanis are the state commands of the police, the DSS, the FCC, all the armed commands, all the armed services have been infiltrated and run, taken over by this, uh, this uh, group. Do you suspect or do you have that feeling that a Taliban-like overrun of Afghanistan is likely in Nigeria? And um, that's just a question. So I would like your view on that. And then I also want to appreciate you for what you, the comments you made regarding the civil war. Some of us have opined severally that part of what why the Biafran's lost the war was uh, Juku's persona. So thank you for just corroborating that. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel, please. Hello, good evening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Melafia, for the painstaking exposition and um, for bearing with us. We know you are much more busy and elderly, but we really appreciate staying up with us. I have just very, I have one observation and uh, and the second one is a question. I'll wrap it up in two minutes. 
The first is um, you made mention that the Ishakiri people and the Akokwedo people are not Yoruba. They are actually Yorubas. If you listen to, you know, they just installed a new Olu of worry. The Omosheye, uh, Omoshola Emiko. The, there was a rancor there and they had actually made it clear on national TV that five families came down to settle 500 years ago around there in Wari and they are actually Yorubas. They made it very clear. And that is why their king is Olu. They are Yorubas. And then the Akoko Edo people, they are a counterpart of the Akoko Ondo people. From Akoko Edo to Akoko Ondo people, is just they are just neighboring. It's the um, military creating states that cut them away from Yoruba people. They are Yoruba people, as in full-blown Yoruba people. Now, my that's just the observation. My question is just one. I am shocked that the people who believed in Nigeria, this one Nigeria thing, even though there's nepotism, even though we can't see a future everywhere, is blue. They are the older generation above 50, above 60. Are you not concerned that 90 to 95 or even more of the younger generation to whom you will bequeath the responsibility of leadership or to whom you will be leaving Nigeria soon if you get old and you retire from active politics or active participation in things like this? Are you not shocked that most of us don't believe in Nigeria anymore? Because the earlier we face the fact, the better. If we cover it under the carpet and sweep it under the carpet that we believe in one Nigeria, we believe in one Nigeria. Sir, I want to tell you that 90 to 95% of us do not believe in Nigeria anymore. And it's a very painful thing and it's shocking because if it is not solved now, it's going to come up in a bigger way. I'll be handling something very much more dangerous. There is civil war looming because we have come to realize that our race, our history is about to become extinct. Yoruba people have lived for over 13,000 years in that location from the radioactive carbon dating they did. And our dynasty, according to Herod Herodotus, written BC, 255 BC, Ilife was mentioned. We are about to be wiped off by Fulani jihadists. Don't you think we should be concerned? Do you think we should embrace one Nigeria, the detriment of our history and the hard work of our ancestors? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bunana, please. Yes. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, my name is Anna Yo. Yes, my name is Anna Yobuna. Uh, I'd like to uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Obedaya Melafia for a very, uh, a very good exposition that is uh, been given us in the course of this program. And uh, Dr. Melafia, I wanted to know that uh, I am one of your big fans. I really appreciate you and uh, uh, I love the way you calmly and surely express uh, your opinion on matter, different issues, economic, social, and political. And I also want to thank you for the bravery you showed some months back when they came for you, you know, standing up against all these evil forces and telling the truth to the people and to the government is something that many people never did, but you did that and you continue to do. So I want you to know that we really appreciate you for that and we love you and we stand with you and we stand by you. Thank you I trained, so I, um, I'm a pharmacist and I'm in, I live in Copenhagen, Denmark. I trained in University of Joss. I um, followed my uncle to uh, Kafanchan several times when he was building uh, Reverend Emmanuel Kuri's uh, prayer, prayer uh, camp in uh, yes. Kafanchan. And oh, I sat in Zuru in KB State. So I have a lot of wow. connection the Plateau, Southern Kaduna, and the Zuru people in Kelly State. So middle best section has, um, I have a connection to that place. And I continue to communicate with my friends who live in Joss, even till today, on what is happening there and following up with them. But I have a few questions. 
The first one is this. Why is it that our youths, especially in our middle bed zone, are not doing enough? It, I, I'm worried when I see or hear the full and uh, young people and they say they are Northern coalition. They are Northern frontiers. They call themselves different names and they are the only ones speaking. I don't see anyone coming from Plateau or from Kaduna. I see a few ones from Southern Kaduna, uh, Sukapu, uh, uh, Mr. Jonathan, Sukapu uh, president. And this is doing a lot you know, within its capacity. But we need to see more. Of course, I see a lot coming from Benue, but it's just the governors. We need to hear more. We need to see more people coming up. Because now we want to have a kind of a link or affiliation with them in the middle bed. But you don't, you don't see anybody you go to. You know? So if our young people there can be you know, mobilized or informed or encouraged to speak out the more, so that young people from the Southeast, South South can have a connect with them. That will help a lot. There are many of us that schooled in that area that will continue to support and stand by anything that happens. Uh, uh, anybody coming from Plateau or, ben, or Benue or in all that middle bed as Southern Kaduna. We have, we have a large population that school there and we are, we are all affiliated to those places. So please, what are we doing with respect to motivating or encouraging the youths in this area to come up media-wise, speak out, mm -hmm. talk, and organize themselves and be together so that we can have a rallying point who we go, we go to for things. That is number one. Number two question. I'm also worried when I don't hear Jera Yakubu Gowan say anything. I, I mean, I don't like dwelling what has happened during the war. I, I wasn't born during the war. Uh, I know a lot of uh, things happen, but I'm ready to forgive and move on, you know? But why is he not saying anything now on the state of the nation? Obasanjo will come out and speak. Danjuma will come out and speak when they started killing people. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, the, the guy from, um, I mean, all the statesmen, they come out Thank and you, speak. Mr. Bonner. You don't hear Yakubu, uh, Gerard Yakubu go and say anything. All right, we have to be saying something on the state of the nation because that will help a lot. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I'm afraid our time is running out. Joseph, I please quickly two, yes. two minutes. I hope it will not run beyond two, two minutes now. Thank you. Yes, I uh, thank everybody that is present. Um, I want to really, really quickly express something that God has made me aware of. It is only by the spirit of wisdom knowledge and understanding that proceeds from God that I speak. I am an Igbo man that was born here in the United States. I came to Nigeria for the first time in 1997 in Ibadan. I was so nourished and cultured by the Yoruba people that for the rest of my life, I will never forget the Yoruba people. Also because of the kind of businesses that my family was in, I had a lot of associations with the Hausas. I was also very deeply uh, nurtured by the houses. And when my feet touched the homeland of Igbo land, I can't express to you uh, the sense of impartation of being able to stand on the place of origin of, of, uh, of my fathers. So with that in mind, I just say that I'm speaking from a place of love for the entire Nigeria. But here is the problem that God has showed me that is causing so much problem. The number one question is, what perspective do you want to have? Are you going to take a God perspective or are you going to take a worldly perspective? They do not mix. You cannot mix the politics of this world with the spiritual truths of God. So the, that question has to be answered. It's the foundation. Are you going to follow? And this encompasses all of God's wisdom. This is not only for those that are in the Bible. This is not only for those that are in traditional practices. These are for those that understand that there's a deeper meaning to life beyond what is seen. So now that once that question is answered, we move forward. The second question is self-determination. People are failing to recognize that self-determination is rebellion to God. 
God created all peoples and all nations and all cultures and all tribes and all people of the world. And it is from God that we must get our purpose. Anybody who chooses to self-determine what their country is going to be or what their nation is going to be or what their own life is going to be in the absence of God's guidance is in rebellion to God. So if we say that we're going to take the God-given a directive, then we must align ourselves with God. And in order to do that, we must go to him to make sense of the chaos that is threatening to wipe out the entire globe. Now, moving forward, God is the creator of all things. And in terms of the, in the terms of the tension that's going on between the South and the North and everything that's going on, my only prayer is for all people to turn in sincerity to God. Because every ideology and everything that is born from the mind must bear the fruit of what it is born from. If you plant a seed of apple, you must get apples. If a person sits there and they, and they use their intellect and their mind to produce any kind of ideology or solution to a problem, that solution in itself must bear fruit of what it is. Meaning, we must go to the source, and the source is God, and God is willing to give the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding that we need, but we must humble ourselves and understand that God is in control of all of these things and seek his solutions. Now, the question now comes, will a person be able to look at all of the things going on that's threatening their identity, their families, their sense of being, what do you, uh, so sorry, Mr. Um, Joseph, what, what is God's solution for Nigeria? Quickly, one minute. The solution is this. I'm glad that you asked, asked that question. The solution is this. All kingdoms of the earth will become the kingdom of Jesus Christ. All foundations that were built, that were not built by the hands of God, will be destroyed. Unless God built the house, the people build in vain. Right, so this you. is the time that's one, one, let me round up, please. This is the time where it says when the foundations are being destroyed, what will the righteous do? So the solution is to please don't find me or anybody else, but to find God and ask God, what is the action that I need to take in this given situation? And we will succeed. We will be able to say that we are victorious. I wish the best for everyone on this line. And I thank you so much, doctor, for taking the time to answer these questions. And my main question is, whose side are we going to take? Are we going to believe God or are we going to trust in man's wisdom? May we all be blessed. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Oche, please. Quickly, two minutes. Mr. Oche, please, two minutes. Elder Tango. Yes. Um, okay. I'm here. All right. Oche, go ahead. I had my notes somewhere and I had to leave, so I'll just have to make use of my memory. Um, I just have a few comments. One is regarding um, uh, Dr. Um, Professor Wallace Inga talked about um, United Nations Protectorate Area for uh, something that they've been working on behind the scenes. I'm wondering if it's an option that will be suitable for the pool of, of uh, Benue State, I mean, the Middle Belt area. Because, you know, if we have, you know, United Nations uh, presence there, the killings may, you know, reduce. Second thing I want to talk about is, um, sorry, I'm out of bed, so, but I'll be, I'll be very quick. Can we you know, agree on one thing and prevent Buhari from getting medical att um, attention in the UK going forward, you know, then maybe they will realize that we in diaspora, we are really very serious about, you know, fixing whatever we are going to get. Is it Nigeria, B Biafra, whatever, right? But he shouldn't, you know, be throwing weddings, doing all this lavishness and going abroad and while our commonwealth is being, you know, destroyed. The last thing I want to speak about is whatever we get out of, you know, going forward, whether it's Nigeria, whether it's eight regional areas, whether it's, you know, whatever we've all been talking about, there's a fundamental issue with us Nigerians. We never, we have never given anything to the country. Nobody volunteers 
for mankind in Nigeria. The only place people volunteer is in church. You see people, they'll go to mosque, they'll give their time, eight hours a day, they'll go to church, there will be ushers and all of that, but nobody contributes into nation building with their free time. In different countries, like maybe for instance, Canada, out of 20 people, you see four at least volunteer food bank for the homeless, for the this, for the that, but we are so selfish as a people. So, all right. and it is us, it is that same, you know, um, character traits that leads up to, you know, the senators, the president and all of that. So as bad as Buhari is, he's a reflection of all of us. I believe in one Nigeria, but it's not at all costs. If, if the North is going to be feeding on all of us, then we should split. So that's my point. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Nathango, go to go, please. We are not taking any more hands, so please, those who are raising up now, has now it's late, raising it late. We'll have another discussion. Maybe you can comment comment in the next section. Elder Tang, go to go, please. I, I appreciate everything that uh, Dr. Maya has said, but um, I, I will still give him one advice. Kabiru, don't go. I want to call Kabiru. I think I'm, I'm no I'm longer saying his Wait, you. Tango, wait, please. I, you will continue. Kabiru, you were raising up your hand. Please keep your hand up because you are making some comments in the chat room. I really want you to make a contribution to the hearing of everyone. I hope you are still here. Kabiru. All right, Elder Tango, continue. So, all that uh, that um, mm, mm, my life has said, um, I appreciate all he's saying, but uh, as, uh, my advice for you is that in this situation, we are looking for peace. There's one proverb in my language that said, any eye medicine doesn't need pepper. You will not miss with the pepper. Uh, I can't of uh, go on and give. He has wanted to go on 100% uh, indirectly condemning or th talking about Ojuku. It's not in Biafra during the war. I, I, I'm in Biafra. I witnessed the war, suffered the war. What happened among us in Biafra, we know what really took place. But now we are saying reconciliation, forgiving. That I wrote it in this volume. Most of the things he said here about Biafra or how Ojuku keep people all this happened is is wrong. And Ojuku did not Ojuku even consulted consult our consult people. Ojuku is young as Gowan. He praised Gowan for for ruling Nigeria, but Ojuku. As a young boy, defending these people that feel like they want to wipe out. By now, that would be nothing like an Igbo man, that would be nothing like Igbo nation. So Ojuku tried a lot. As he feel go and try, Ojuku tried for Igbo too. Any go, any Igbo man condemning Ojuku has his own reason. Ojuku forfeit all his father's money. He can buy his way. He can go any part of the world and live peacefully. But he decided to fight for his people. So any any Igbo man that talk, that said anything against Ojuku is wrong. It's wrong. And all Ojuku said is happening now. Go back to your species, to all, to all the species. So, for uh, you, um, his presentation, his presentation to today, and the way he said things about Ojuku, give me another side of him. I wrote it in in, in, in here. That, you, all right, we, uh, thank you. So, all right, let him change that that topic next time. I beg. Let him continue. All right, we well, thank you, Mr. Kabiru Muhammad. Thank you. Uh, hello. Yes. Um, I'm sorry I came in late, and that's why I raised my hand a little late. Well, first of all, I am Kabiru Muhammad Gongozo from Kano, Kano City. Hello. Hello? Yes, Hello? go ahead. We are listening, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. I, it, it was like off. I thought uh, I wasn't on. Right. Um, as I said, I'm Kabir Ahmed Gubazo from Kano City. I'm a journalist and, and um, an active politician, sort of, not the kind of APC PDP politician. Right, uh, as I wrote in my comment, my understanding of the problems we face right now is, is not about uh, a middle belt, um, south alliance or a north, South Alliance or a North-West Alliance or an East-West or whatever alliance. It is, um, it is about going back to what we lost that led us to the Civil War. We lost innocence. We lost the concept of uh, running our system on the basis of working for the people, serving the people. 
our leaders in the First Republic, Zeke, Awo, Sadona, and uh, others, including Amino Kano, our Amino Kano of the NEPU and uh, PRP, were all there in service to serve the people. They may have had their own uh, failings, which were many, but we made the mistake of blowing those differences we had to gain advantage in the First Republic. That trying to gain advantage was what created a mindset that led us to civil war. Now, that kind of thing became the currency of people who want to get to power whenever elections are coming up. You will notice two years to elections, the kind of, uh, the, the, the way we are worked up is such that uh, you, you think it's the end of the world, right? And uh, invariably it is by, it, 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 it is more, it's more fierce with those sections that feel, okay, we have been out of the loop. It is now an opportunity. Like it's the turn of the Southwest, is the turn of the South-South, is the turn of the Southeast, is the turn of the North, is the turn of uh, North Central, is the turn of Northeast, is the turn of Northwest. These are the things that we as uh, people have gone to school. I went to school with people, I have, I still have Igbo friends. Dennis was my classmate in 1972, 72, 76, and we are still in touch. Dennis Anes is his name. Emeka Aoboku was my classmate in 72, 76. I have, I still have, right now I have a text, I have not replied to my friend, Paul from Kaduna, Mundi from Kaduna, James. Dimka is my was my classmate in Britain in, in, in journalism class, and uh, I I have family of Hausa Fulani in Jos. I have friends in Jos in Plateau. It is that kind of mindset that we have to return to. We have I am in PRP. I'm a national officer of the party. My, my, our national secretary of, of of both two factions that we have which has been resolved now, uh, from the Southwest. One is from uh, Tunde, is from Ondo, and uh, Godwin Kalu is from uh, Adia, I believe. And uh, our only, the only candidate, presidential candidate who, 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 put, who, who signed to become candidate in 2019 in PRP was Ibo. She is a, an Ibo lawyer, a, a lady. Right. If if we if we realize this is the problem, the problem is not Buhari. I I voted Buhari. I have never voted anybody but Buhari because I thought not because I didn't I I I, I was being tribalistic, but because not because Buhari is Polanyi, but because I thought Buhari had the kind of integrity we needed, the kind of capacity we needed needed to run the country, not the kind of thing that we saw Obasanjo we doing. I when we had no candidate in 2019 in, in my party PRP, even as a deputy governorship candidate in my party, I, I, I thought the option is not to vote for PDP, but rather to be, because I, I cannot see myself voting for Atiku then, because I thought Atiku, despite everything, is in PDP, and PDP is not the answer. Not, of course, I know the APC of Buhari has also adopted almost everything that is, that, that is PDP, this, as PDP as PDP probably was, <laughs> right? But, but then, how do you resolve this? Well, how we resolve it is all of us where we are, we hit onto a pol political platform that we believe can deliver the goods for us. We shouldn't waste our time about thinking of that, uh, okay, we have to, have a big, we have to belong to the, to, to the winning party or to the biggest party or to the strongest party. When these big and strong ones, so-called, have proved that with their big, with their being big and strong, they have they, they are only there big for themselves. If the wedding, the royal wedding we had in Kano, in Kano in Bichi, uh, is anything to look at, it confirms the all of them up there, including Obadiah. I'm sure he was invited. 
if and if you and I, I, well, I, I don't know, but I believe he must have been invited because he's a big man. He is a big northerner, not a big plateau man, not a big middle belter. He's a big northerner. He, he grew up, he became what he became because he's a northerner, because he was representing a certain constituency within the north. You grew, Ojikalu grew because he was an easterner in quotes. Tinubu and everybody grew because of where they came from. And nobody chose where he came from. Nobody chose where he was created. Nobody chose the religion he was, he, he was brought up in. The Fulanis, who are my brothers and sisters, most of them, 95% of them, are not even Muslims. And those who are Muslims among them, those who are running around in the bushes, don't even have the faintest idea of what Islam is about. It's not, it's not about killing people. It's not about cutting off hands. It's not about it, 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 the same thing like Christianity. I have no beef with it. What I think we need to do is to identify political platforms, to identify like-minded persons, to, to work towards building or, or reviving the consensus that we used to have and uh, seeking the best of people at whatever level. In 1979, I did not vote for Sheo Chagbari. I was a PRG person. In 1983, I did not vote for Chagbari. I voted for Zik. I was an NPP. In, in 1991, uh, was it? I voted for Adiola. Before then, I was rooting for Falaye because he was the man in my political, in the, uh, 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 in my political uh, um, group. He was the one presented by our people. And that's the kind of mindset that most of us up north have. We are worried that people refuse to, un to, to understand that this is the thoughts of people from the north, the sort of people who are Muslims. And for those who are talking about uh, the Taliban, about Afghanistan, if it would have, if it would work, it would have worked with the idiots who did the medicine in Kanu. It did not. It would have worked with those who, who were in the Boko Haram over there. And, and it, it, it is it is it, it, it is not it is not a Nigerian thing. It cannot work in Nigeria. Muslims will be Muslims, Christians will be Christians, animists will be animists. But people who have gone to school should be a little above such negative, divisive sentiments. In fact, whoever is talking about alliance between so and so is not talking facts. He is blinding blindfolding you guys. Take what happened in, uh, just last week in Bichi and in Abuja. The iPhone they used, they used, the whatever. <laughs> this is, uh, the the, the Bonhomi. Who was the guy who gave out the daughter? Who was the guy who gave out the, the son? It, it, one was a Chico PDP, I think, and, and the other is Sue. I think it's Osibaju, APC, and Yoruba, PDP, and the Fulani. They, they, they are all together. Why should we continue to, pass, to pursue that kind of, of narrative? It won't help us. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, Elomba. I am pleased with the kind of advocacy you are doing. And uh, I invite you all to PRP. Thank you very much. We, we thank you very much. Before you go, let me ask you just one question before we go to Dr. Uh, um, my life. Are you Hausa? Yeah, are you Hausa or Fulani, uh, Mr. Kabiru Mohammed? I am not. I am Fulani. My father, 19, now 19 years late, was Fulani. My mother, 15, what, 15 years ago, gone. Was Fulani. Okay. I am Fulani. All right, thank Married you very much. A mix of uh, whatever. I, I thank you very much. I would like to I'm invite you. I would like to invite you. I would like to invite you in my program once, if you are able to appear. Dr. Memelafia, uh, please. Are you. And just a reminder uh, the, the House of Rest member 2015 2019 from Kanusti. His father. Right. Walked into Kano and Ibo man. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. And he was, he, and, he, and he married a Kano person, and he became a commissioner in Kano. 
and he became a member of House of Reps in Kano, Kano City. And I was chairman of Kano City Council in 1996, elected. And I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't find a kobo of my because I don't have a kobo, as you don't. And I'm right. still a politician. Well, we thank you very much. I would like to have you on our program one of these days. I give you my number in the chat room. Okay. Doctor okay. Melania, please. Can you, yes, uh, you, you have my number because I'm on the group, right? Okay, I don't have your number, but if you kindly send it to me on, on WhatsApp, I'll get it. Okay. Oh, it was three four five one one seven two one. No, uh, let, let's take it later. Let me let's hear from Dr. Melafia. Dr. Melafia, can you just in two minutes, please, just summarize your thoughts based on all the responses you've gotten, and then if you just give us fifteen minutes to speak offline after that, can you just summarize two minutes? Thank you, sir. Well, to be honest with you, I have so many questions here. <laughs> uh, someone is asking, uh, "What have they done to me? Why am I sober now?" Look, I am not an activist. I'm a development economist, I'm a researcher, I'm a scholar, I'm a, a consultant. I'm not a plaque carry. Have you ever seen me anywhere with a placard? I only came out to speak because people are dying. I'm not a rubble rouser. Don't, don't put me in that category at all. So that every day I should be shouting this, shouting that, and uh, I, I'm not, look, if Nigerians are tired of living together, they should let us know. We are ready to, uh, you know, to, when a company is insolvent, you, you know, you, 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 you close it down. We can work on the process of closing down the system if the company is insolvent. So uh, I can help you do that when you are ready, when the time comes for it, but I'm not, I'm not a rabble rouser. I am not uh, an activist in that sense. Um, and uh, so, so nothing is wrong with me. This is the real me. I'm not, I'm not a rabble rouser, flag carrying activist, noisemaker. But I am a public intellectual and where people are being killed, that one, you gave, you robbed me the wrong way. And <laughs> whoever it is, even if it's Adolf Hitler, I will speak up to him, whoever he is. And please, it is not from me you are going to hear that you want to break up Nigeria. That is none of my business. When the country is tired and people want to break up, fine, we will help them, you know, resolve the issues and the, you know, so that everybody can carry their own wahala and go, and then we we'll find another uh, way to survive. Well, and uh, actually I'm worried about the last speaker. Nice gentleman, but to him, there are no killings. UNICEF told us a few weeks ago that 345,000 children died in the Northeast alone over the last 12 years. Zulu, governor of uh, Borno, said last week that 450,000 Borno people are missing. Their families cannot trace wherever they are. That's in the Northeast alone. 345 plus 450,000. They're talking about almost 900. In the Northeast alone. So we are talking about probably more than a million people have died in Nigeria. And we are carrying on as if John, come and join PRP and all your problems will be solved. They have not addressed the genocide going on, the killing of people in Southern Carolina, the killing of people. Does it mean, mean anything to you? So that's my problem with the Northern intelligence here. Genocide is going on, jihad is going on. You're quiet. And you see your silence speaks louder than anything else. It speaks, it makes us doubt your sincerity of purpose because life is sacred. And if so many people are dying and you're quiet and you are silent, then your silence is called complicity. So uh, I don't know, it's a key, uh, are they Yoruba? Why do you call them Chikiri? Why don't you call them? Oh, um, Dr. Melafia, there are so many issues raised in the question that are not really what okay. we will address tonight. So exactly. if you just give but us anyway, your submission. Also, yeah. My, my submission is that look, Nigeria is at a critical juncture. I am one of those who believe that look, Life brings challenges. Every generation has its challenges to meet. Some have already given up. 
Maybe we are not the sort that give up too easily. I'm not one of those who give up too easily. But it's not because I, I somehow believe in the sacrosanct nature of Nigeria. I just believe that for the sake of Africa, for the sake of the black race, we need a big country, not a small one. And my economist, my Harvard economist, you should know something or two about economies of scale. That uh, a smaller country, you know, in terms of scale economies, is not as attractive as a very big country. So, you know, uh, in an objective scientific sense, a bigger country is, is, is a potentially more powerful one. If we could make Nigeria work, it would be an amazing country. It would be just a fantastic and an amazing country. But of course, the choice is ours. Uh, somebody said 95% of the youth don't believe in Nigeria anymore. Uh, 95, many of them also are, are into drugs anyway, are into all kinds of things, cultism, something some of us never had. So don't think your generation is any better than any or any wiser or more intelligent. Dr. Melafia, I thank you very much. Uh, it's been a very, very engaging session. We are happy and appreciate your coming to our program tonight.